Hello there, great person, and welcome to this video. Have you ever wondered what exactly the German terms in Frieren mean? What are their symbolisms? What are their translations? And why are they even in the story? Fret not today, I will try to shed some light on those questions. And as you probably notice, I am a German native speaker. So watching this anime gave me a great pleasure because the names are actually beyond well chosen and I think if you don't know the names and their meanings you might actually lose a lot of the story that is playing out uh, both uh, visually and narratively. So I will try to help you a bit uh, in understanding what exactly we're talking about here. Uh, so I will give you uh, the German translations, uh, I will give you the associations I have with them as a native speaker. I will give you the symbols that uh, I used uh, in the manga, uh, both on screen and uh, in the narrative. And uh, I will give you some of my interpretations as well. And you should always, of course, be aware that those interpretations are just what I think about it. I think there is evidence for most of them and I will present that evidence. But you can, of course, in the end decide on your own if you think it's reaching if you think it's nonsense or if you think uh, there is something to what I'm saying. So without further ado, let's uh, go into a deep dive of Core 1 Frieren. And uh, of course, there will be no spoilers for Core 2. I have not seen it. I've also not seen the opening and ending. I've just watched Season 1, Core 1 of Frieren. And I've done a deep dive analysis during my watch uh, through. You can see it on the channel. So if you are interested in that, check it out. And also don't uh, forget to like and subscribe. And uh, of course, also share the video if you think there is something interesting or valuable here for you. Um, I would, of course, uh, love uh, for the Frieren community to uh, see it and uh, give uh, the people there who are, as far as I understood, mostly very, very lovely people, some more stuff to think about, to hypothesize. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, get into it. Um, yeah, I don't have anything against people sharing this around. I don't have anything against people reacting to parts of this. I don't know if it's even something someone would want to do. But I think uh, I will give some uh, clarity to some stuff and also explain some of the artistic choices that were made in this uh, anime adaptation and probably in the manga as well. I have not read the manga, uh, but I have been told that there are many, many panels taken from the pages and... I also got the feeling because there is some genius, genius uh, writing and there is some genius art to be found here. So the video will be uh, separated into several parts. Uh, there will be an introduction where I will talk about why there even is German. Why, why, why would anyone choose this, 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 this way of doing stuff in German when they are Japanese? Um, and uh, it will uh, probably take you down a small rabbit hole. After that, I will dive into all the German terms that were used in Core 1. I hope I didn't forget any. I asked the people who watched my reactions to see if I missed something. They said I didn't, so I hope I really didn't. Um, after that, I will give you a, uh, a possible uh, spoiler to the ending that arises from one translation of a word. So be aware, it will be marked down here uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the timeline. So just skip that if you don't want to hear it. It is just a hypothesis, of course. But uh, after watching Core 1, it is like 40% chance that there is something to it, I think. So beware if you don't want any spoilers for the end of the series. Not the season, the series. Um, but uh, without further ado, let's get into it and um, have some fun. And I hope you enjoy this, as I said, and uh, relax a bit, listen to the German and see if you find something of value here. So here we go. Let's dive into Frieren, Call One. Doch ich frag, ich frag mich, wer wir sind.
So why is there even German in Frieren? Why would anybody choose to pick another language to name places and characters in their story? Uh, I actually came up with three possible explanations. There's a very, very surface level explanation, so to speak. There is an explanation which goes a bit deeper and there is a very, very deep explanations. I will go into all three of them and you can tell me in the comments how far you agree with uh, these. And you will probably all agree, hopefully, or perhaps not, with number one and then, you know, it gets a bit more perhaps reaching. But I think there is evidence for all of these three uh, interpretations of why there is German in this story. So, number one, why is there German in Frieren? Why are there names? In, in German? And the answer is because it sounds cool. Like, I, I can imagine someone's Japanese and uh, they, they hear a German word. They might think, oh, that sounds cool. That sounds magical. Uh, because of some, some people uh, in the comments have actually told me who are apart from Japan. So thanks and shout outs to Japan. You're awesome. Love uh, what you produce. Anime, manga, it's such brilliant stuff. But they have told me that Historically speaking, Germany and Japan had some ties in trading foremost. And I'm not speaking, of course, about the World War II stuff. Like before that, there was a close connection between Germany and Japan. And it uh, went back very, very far in time, at least from our perspective. And I, I, I uh, think that uh, during these uh, relations that we had, like that our countries had, there were some German terms uh, that went into the Japanese culture, went into their language. So, especially in medicine, I think there are many German medicine terms, or at least terms that are close to German. So, medicine is something that was long thought to be like something magical a bit. And so, uh, Germany uh, actually is seen as a bit magical, I guess. For some Japanese people. And if you're Japanese, of course, you can tell me, did you ever encounter any German in your life other than perhaps German lessons in school? I would be very interested in that. But as far as I understand, it's it's a language that's often used in magic and mysticism in the anime and manga culture, which is cool. So I hope I find some more cool stories where German plays a part and I can enlighten you a bit. But yeah, so that's reason one. Like it's, it sounds cool. It's, 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 it's cool. So, uh, yeah. But reason two already is a bit more deep. So reason two why people are called German names or why places are called German names. So the second reason, which is a bit deeper, is because they are named after German concepts. So they are not professions or something. We've had names that were professions, actually, and we will get to that. But mainly it's, it's very abstract stuff that they're named after. And uh, these abstract things they're named after encapsulate core elements of characters and places. And that is a very, very cool thing for a German. I can assure you that. So when I watched it, my first reactions were always like, oh, why is this character called like this? Like, what could be, what could it be about them that makes them have this name? And the names actually were very, very meaningful and well researched. And I am actually pretty sure that whoever wrote these names and thought them up is at least in part a native speaker or had a very, very good native speaker as a consultant. Because the way the terms are used is something that many Germans wouldn't be able to do, actually, which makes it incredibly awesome and satisfying to dive into them. Um, we will see later what I mean by that. Uh, especially people like Haita or Himmel, they're German names, like they have meanings you, that will, I think, blow your mind when I explain some more stuff about them. And I will, of course, explain more than I did in my uh, initial reactions and my initial uh, watching of the anime, because I've, I've done quite some research on some of these things. And I have to say that the names chosen are absolutely brilliant and they encapsulate core uh, themes of the characters or places. And we will, of course, get into what those are when we go into the, in a deep, uh, in, the, in the deep dive, so to speak, of the German names later. But that's basically the second reason. The names are chosen because they enca encapsulate very, very strong themes and motives that are connected with the places and people uh, 
um, that they they uh, name. And that's actually pretty awesome. Like when, when I went in, I actually thought it was like Goblin Slayer. Like for those of you who have not seen Goblin Slayer, they are they are heroes, so to speak, in this anime. It's also medieval fantasy um, age a bit. And there are these people who have who are like warriors or priests, and they're like just called warrior or priest. Like that's their name. It's like the, the, the profession is their name. And that is all there is to it. It is pretty cool, but like there's no really, really deep layer underneath it. So I was going into this thinking it would be the same. But when Fan up here appeared, I think that was the point where I was like, oh wait a moment. These concepts are very abstract. And Character traits these characters have and places have, they, they fit with that a bit. So let's see what's going on here. So that was reason number two. Uh, these German names name core themes of characters and places and are very well chosen, as you will see. So um, the third reason why the names are German, um, that is actually my favorite reason. And this is perhaps the reason you might disagree with a bit. Um, and I will have to talk a bit about some stuff you think might not be connected with it. But this is the reason that made me think this is one of the most brilliant pieces of art of the century. And I don't say this lightly. Like I don't say this because uh, it sounds cool. I don't say it because People will be like, oh, he likes it so much. That's cool. Let's, let's, uh, let's support this. No, it's because I think that um, when I went into this anime, I did not think that it would be this profound and well done. Um, and this is the first reason that I realized, uh, or, or the, the first thing that I realized where I was like, wow, this is something different. Um, it is something that has to do with what kind of story Frieren is. And I will tell you what kind of story it is in a moment. Um, but to uh, illustrate it a bit, I have prepared something. And um, I, I want you to experience a bit something before we talk about it more. And I hope it works. So if you know any German, this will not work for you. So if, you're, uh, if you speak German, you will be like, okay, I know what he's doing. but. Um, I want to uh, tell you a little story but the, uh, that is taking place in the Frieren universe, so to speak. And I want to read it to you. It is the same style. So there's an English story and the names are German. And it's the same thing. So uh, it will help you understand a bit, it a bit better, though, I, I think. Um, so let, let, let's so. So I will, I will now read the story. Rote Reitkappe wanted to visit Omar. But Omar lived in the unheimlich forest. So she had to be careful not to run into demons, which is something that might happen in the Frieren universe, as we know. One day when she went to Omar, she got distracted by Blumenlichtung. The demon Böser Wolf saw this and decided to torture her. He ran to Omar and ate her. When Rote Reitkappe came to Omar's house, she was ambushed by Böser Wolf and eaten as well. Luckily, Förster saw this and killed Böser Wolf. He was able to save Omar and Rote Reitkappe, who were not yet digested. So I don't know if this works. Perhaps you were immediately like, okay, I know what this is. Um, but I will now read the story again and I will just translate the German words I used into English and you immediately, immediately will know what I'm talking about, what kind of story Frieren is, and it would, I hope it will open your eyes. And it has been brought up in episodes as well, so you might already know, but I thought this was cool. So I will now like, use the same story, same words, just the German words in English. Red Riding Hood wanted to visit Grandmother, but Grandmother lived in the scary forest, so she had to be careful not to run into demons. One day, when she went to Grandmother, she got distracted by clearing of flowers. The demon bad wolf saw this and decided to torture her. He ran to Grandmother and ate her. When Red Riding Hood came to Grandmother's house, she was ambushed by bad wolf and eaten as well. Luckily, forest ranger saw this and killed bad wolf. He was able to save Grandmother and Red Riding Hood, who were not yet digested. So, 
Yeah, it's a fairy tale. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was a very long wind to say that, uh, saying that Frieren is a fairy tale. But Frieren is not any fairy tale. Frieren is probably the most complex and best thought up fairy tale that ever existed, to my knowledge. And I would actually compare it to uh, what, a po what, what Faust is to a poem. So I don't know if you know Faust from Goethe. So Goethe wrote a poem, which is a book, like he wrote, like, I think it's 600 to 1000 pages. I'm not that sure how many there are, but it's a single poem, which tells this big story about someone who does a deal with Satan and uh, gets powers and tries to figure out what piety is and stuff. But it's just one poem. It's the biggest and most complex poem of the world, I would say. And Frieren is the pendant of that to uh, like in, like it's the it's a fairy tale version of that so normally fairy tales are not that long they are encapsulating some very important stuff but frieren is a fairy tale that's very very long very complex and it has many many layers and themes in it and um yeah you you will recognize that as well now because now the german names will make sense because that is what in fairy tales happens like the, the people in fairy tales they are not named Joseph or whatever, most of the times not. They are, are named like um, uh, concepts as well a bit, like Snow White, uh, Red Riding Hood, or, um, I don't know, Sleeping Beauty, or um, yeah, Big Bad Wolf, or, um, or Pied Piper. You know, these, these are all like these, 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 these fairy tales. They are like characters in these fairy tales. They have these... These names that are concepts as well. And um, Frieren or Sosono Frieren, as the whole title is, a uh, title is, <laughs> slipped into German. So that, that reminds me a lot of Snow White or Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, like because it's the same. Like in Germany, we would either say it's Snow White or we would say it's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I've heard people call it Frieren, but the real thing is Sosono Frieren. And I'm sorry, Japanese people, I mispronounced that probably. But um, realizing that, like, I was really taken aback because the thing is, it is not only like a fairy tale, like, it, it doesn't try to emulate it. It is a fairy tale. Like, it, it has this profoundness that the fairy tale has, has gotten through countless retellings and uh, countless years past that made it from, like, a raw story or perhaps even something real into this story that is told again and again through generations. And the same vibe we get from Frieren as well. So I actually think as well, by the way, that Frieren is a story being told to us. Like what we see, and again, this is an interpretation, but what we see in Frieren is the story of, the story of Frieren told to us as viewers. And I have some suspicion who is telling the story um, and it will either be Frieren tells the story like way down in the future and she has forgotten the names like the real names of her companions and uh, the real names of the places which is something that was and I was like I, I thought about this before episode 16 and episode 16 came and, and the, the dwarf came and the dwarf was like yeah I don't remember my wife's face it was like 300 years were past and I don't remember her face. I don't remember uh, her, 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 how she looked, her smile, but I remember who she was. I remembered her core and I was actually waiting for him to name her. He didn't. I was a bit sad about that, but that's basically what happened in Frieden as well. This story is long ago if it even was real. We have had that discussed in the series as well by Himmel when he's like, I don't want to be a fairy tale. I'm real. So, you know, but the Himmel we probably see, like everyone and every place we see is like uh, a transformed version through time, through being told to us. And um, as I said, it's either Frieren telling it to us or it is someone who heard it from Frieren and it is passed down and down even further down the line. And I don't know, it might even be that in the end we get Frieren sitting in a modern city like on a park bench um, under the, the meteor shower and she tells the story to children. That might be something. I don't know. It might not fit. It's just like, it's just a funny thought. It's not even, 
I don't even necessarily think that's a thing. But you know, the, the, this 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 is this sense is what I'm getting from all of this, and that is why I love it so much. It's it is exactly that. It is like a story where all the places and characters are named after important story beats, and you will notice that a lot when we later go into the story beats and the and the names linked to them and you will be like yes of course it is because every single name almost every single name has a very very big meaning for the story and if you were like oh what was that place called we were at i don't know but it was the place where we got engaged so we would call it engaged place and this is like what happened to all of the stories so to speak and i will make bring you a lot of evidence for that actually i think and i think it's very compelling so always keep this in mind. You might think about Frieren as a fairy tale, a story that has been told again and again, or that is told in the far future from when this actually happened. So it is not exactly the real thing. It is from the perspective of perhaps even Frieren. It might not be, but it also might. And we hear and see and experience it as a story and condensed to the uh, uh, essence of the story and in one reaction I actually uh, told to uh, talk to you about this as well so if we tell a story again and again we know from research and psychology that the story will be condensed down to its core and uh, so that is also like it is named like there are names given to these core concepts so the story is really condensed and uh, I actually love that so I can't wait to see if you would agree with this I think it's pretty clear that it's a fairy tale, but not only like because it's about elves and demons and stuff, but because it has the structure of a fairy tale and it feels like a fairy tale. To me as a German, hearing it and, and seeing it, it feels like a real fairy tale. It, is, it feels like something the Brothers Grimm could have heard and told people. Like it's not artificial, it feels so real and that is why I love it. And of course, many fairy tales are from Germany as well. So that might also be why the words are German. Because like it's 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 Germany is a country people might associate with fairy tales. When I was young, I did, because most of the fairy tales came from Germany. I think that people know like Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, all of that came from Germany, I think, or at least uh, the Central European regions, as far as I know. So I mean it also makes sense to make these these condensed um condensed concepts and names german because that's that's like fairy tale like i think tell me what you think about this but uh yes those are the three reasons why i think it's in german and i will try to give you evidence for especially point 3 so if you're interested in that of course keep watching and if you've skipped this part that's fine as well um <laughs> Yeah, we will now get uh, into the uh, names and of their uh, pronunciation, meaning in German, and what I think they mean in the story and how they are presented to us in Frieren. So I hope you will enjoy that as well. And let's just go start with episode one. So episode one, we start the show. And the first thing to keep in mind is what is the story going to be about? It's in the title. It's the funeral march of Frieren. So I will at least, until I have evidence to the contrary, I will assume it is exactly that. It is Frieren coming to terms with the death of people she cherished and getting to know them after they died and facing her regret of losing them and trying to connect with them after death because there's something value that she had with them and to explore why that is. So I will also assume this story is told from the viewpoint of Frieren. Um, and the evidence for that that I would say is most convincing is there are just some scenes where it is clearly from her perspective. Um, very subtly done though. And you might argue them as well again, but like, for example, something I found striking is the situation where they attack the dragon. Fern is told to attack the dragon. She casts her Zoltrak, I think, at it. Doesn't do anything. And the dragon attacks them. And the situation is very comical. It's painted comically. 
Fern is on the ground, afraid, and it's it's played for laughs and Frieren is like, oh, well, so we have to, uh, uh, like, hit it and run again and again. It's going to be fun. And if you really look at Fern, she's absolutely terrified. Like, she's terrified below her belief. But if you would tell the story from the perspective of Frieren, you would get the situation. Like, she, she doesn't really care. It's just a dragon. She's killed probably several of those. She knows them. It's like a normal day for her. And that's the way the scene is presented. So that is uh, uh, an example for me thinking it is from, at least from Frieren's viewpoint. Um, there are two other things where there are themes and ways that things are portrayed uh, that heavily imply that they are how Frieren experiences them. And they will come up very soon with Haita and Himmel. Um, there will be something that hopefully blows your mind with those two. And I think, in general, um, Frieren is about um, understanding what the past was. So there are hints that Frieren did connect with the people she tries to reconnect with, but she doesn't really know. It's just subconscious. And it is in the, in the art that she already connected with the people, but she tries to, like, bring it to the surface and make it uh, accessible to her mind, so to speak. So, um, let's go and uh, look at the first, first German name. Oh, by the way, I will not translate the map that's shown in the beginning and not the Flammer quote, because they will come up later, and I do not have enough information on some of the places on the map, so I will not try to guess there. Like, they will come up in Core 2, if you want me to do a video like this again in Core 2, of course, tell me in the comments and like this as well, so I know you like this. I mean, that's what it's for. Also, what I want uh, to uh, make very, very clear as well, um, there might be connections I have missed. You might think I am overreaching on parts, and that's perfectly fine. I will just give you the all the possible interpretations and connotations I know. And if you are like, yeah, this one doesn't suit for me, I don't agree with this, that is fine. Like Then you perhaps find another interpretation that you like. And that's the way it is with fairy tales, actually. Like, the, the moral of the story, it's not always, like, one definite moral. People can get their own stuff from them. And that's why I also love that Frieren does it. And I am sure you will get your own explanations as well, your own meanings. I just want to guide you a bit into directions that are there. And in the end, you can choose to go, of course, the way you want and think about it the way you want. I just want to give you some food for thought. Yeah, we start off with the banger. Rieren herself. Rieren is a German uh, term. Uh, there is a speciality in the um, pronunciation. So you have the I and the E. It is pronounced E, like um, it would be a double, a double E, I think, in English. Uh, the same sound you make there. So it's frieren. Um, sometimes I say frieren, which is what you would say colloquially. Sometimes, sometimes you, you uh, gulp down uh, some sounds of the word because you're in a hurry and you speak not very precisely. So I might say frieren, but the correct, clean pronunciation is frieren. And frieren means freezing. And um, I think that is a brilliant, brilliant thing to call her, because there are several, several associations I have with this. So first of all, frieren is, it's kind of like a feeling. It's not completely an emotion, but it's, it's what you feel when you are cold. It is not the coldness itself, like it's being cold. And there are several things associated with it. Um, first of all, of course, she is, seems cold and distant, apathetic, or whatever you say, apathic. Like, like, like she, she seems very uncaring at first glance. Um, she seems very closed off alone. She often looks sad, of course, um, which is, of course, be because of several things, like her home village got destroyed, her friends were killed. That is where we first hear her or hear her. Not really hear her, but that's the first time we know that she used the name Frieren. 
even though that might not be even be her real name and just what she thinks she's called if when she looks back or if someone tells the story like it's a fitting name for this character but yeah so the first time we hear of Frieren is when her village is dead her people are dead she's alone so it is metaphorically speaking she's cold inside and she's shivering inside she doesn't know what to do she's uncertain she's Pro probably even lost her drive to move which is also something what happens when you're cold in physics um, and um, there are also instances when she's ice cold against demons because of course of her village uh, because of her village she hates them with a passion and when demons are going after her and she gives them a chance and they don't care and still go after her she's an ice cold killer she doesn't care about them then. It's like also as if she's freezing inside when she looks at demons, both, of, both because of the hatred she feels and also because she doesn't even see them as, as creatures. Some commenters have even pointed out in the reactions that she talks about them as if they were insects when she kills them and squashes them. So there's this ice cold aura around her when she faces off the demons and when she uh, for faces down aura as well and when she tells her to do the deed in the end she's uncaring cold she doesn't even um, respect her enough to look at her when she does it aura i mean like when aura does it so there's also like like this aspect of coldness but it is also of course not feeling connected to the people you love or perhaps not even understanding love um, something that might come because of the passage of time she has experienced because she was alone for a thousand years because she is now alone again um, because yeah she's traumatized basically and this this theme of not feeling connected like not having body bodily warmth that you can like a warm up with so to speak metaphorically speaking that she is missing through all of this through her lack of connections that is a driving point of her character and it drives her so to speak through the story she wants to rediscover her friends she wants to connect with them she wants to uh, thaw up a bit she wants to understand the people she she loved i think she did love them and there are hints throughout the story and we will talk about them a bit i think and there might be others in core 2 and in the future but she tries to like not freeze anymore and it goes even further like she's often depicted with a scarf she's freezing in several scenes in core one where she's just cold um she is when she is in the uh, uh, in the schwer mountains she's collapsing because there's a snowstorm because she can't take it anymore and her design as well she's like has, has this this very cold color palette like she's this white a uh, bluish uh, a color palette that she has and her like she never really smiles when you look at her like she does smile on occasion of course which is always a big moment because she's so so cold and distant and some people have also pointed out that it might be because she's frozen in time so to speak because she lives potentially forever i don't know because that would be um gefroren in german and I think the author was very precise with the language. He has been at least with some other characters that were very well done. So I think that's why Frieren is called Frieren. She's sad, depressed, wants to reconnect. She's alone. She feels different. She feels cold towards the demons. And she thinks the world is a cold place. And that is who she is. So that is what we know in Core 1 about Frieren. And there are moments when, of course, this is not the case, when she does reconnect, when she shows kindness, and when she shows through some actions that she does understand some stuff about people. But the main thing that we have as a person wants to reconnect and is freezing because she's alone and feels alone in the world because of various reasons. So that's Frieren. Himmel, the hero. So this is a pretty straightforward forward word. Himmel, it's, I think it's almost uh, 
pronounced the way you would think it is. I think the E in the end that it is an E is a bit weird perhaps for you, but it is pronounced Himmel. So uh, there you go. Uh, what does that mean? Himmel actually has, I would say, three meanings. Two are very closely connected and I think some Germans would actually argue they are the same for us. I would love to differ there a bit though. And um, so the first meaning Himmel does have is sky. So it's basically everything that's up there that if you, if you go outside, you look up, that's what you see. You see the sky. And Himmel, of course, has the meaning of something Frieren wants to reconnect with. Himmel is probably the main driving force, I feel, because there are hints of uh, Romans or a Romans not that, that not did not that, that was not there that could have been. Yeah, a Romans that could have been. And Himmel is the one who is often shown knowing her very well. For example, when they meet and he immediately seems to understand that she's hiding her mana. Um, or when he talks to her when they're with the flowers and he's like, yes, I like the flowers. And later she produces them at his grave. And that is one of her first steps to understand him, I think, in the episodes where she's like, oh, that's what he would have loved, the flowers. And uh, these flowers from his home village and hide his home village as well. So, um, yeah, what is very, very striking is that the sky as an artistic theme is very, very often shown. There are either night skies shown where there are many stars and people like look at them or the era meteor shower is also like in the night sky and you see the sky there is a theme. And if you pay attention in Cure 1, there's sometimes just, just a sudden shot of blue sky and almost nothing on the, on the screen anymore. And with that, I think it's very heavily implied to me that the author tells us Himmel is there. Like Himmel is our theme. Himmel is something Frieren wants to go after. Himmel is her goal. She can always look at her goal, so to speak, when she looks up and he's there with her. And it also shows to me that in a sense, she carries him with her already because she did connect with him a bit. And he was with her and he was a friend and perhaps even more to her. And she doesn't really realize that what you, if you watch the anime, there is very, very often this blue, blue sky that people look at. For example, Stark and Eisen look at it when they are like in, in the, in, in, I think they are in Val. Like they look at it. Um, it is there when uh, Haita speaks to Fern for the first time when he finds her and he says, I want to do something that Himmel would have done. And in the background, there's just like, height is very small, like the, the, he's drawn very small and there's this huge bl just blue in the background, like, like signali uh, signaling that height are also like understood Himmel and he's there in that scene, to, so to speak. And this is actually a theme that will come up later, once or twice again with other characters. Um, Himmel is the most striking and Himmel is the first I... I really spotted. Like I was like, oh, why are they showing the blue sky all the time? Yeah, because it's Himmel. Himmel was the sky, also the night sky. And here's that what we go for because Frieren wants to find Himmel again. Um, and I love that. It's so beautiful. And if you pay attention, there are like some scenes where it hits you even harder. Um, the, the second is, of course, um, heaven. Himmel also means heaven, and um, there are two kinds of heaven this means. Both are similar, as I said, that's what I meant. One is um, paradise, um, bliss. So if you go to heaven, you go to paradise. Like, it will be perfect. It will be something you love. You will want to stay there forever. It will be everything you wished for. And I love that because Himmel, in a way, is everything Frieren wishes for, to understand him, like to be there and experience him, be with him and be engulfed by him. And then there will be bliss and happiness. And she wants that because she's freezing, Frieren. And I love that. It's so, so well done. And it fits as well with Himmel. Um, we are going for Himmel. We are going for paradise of paradise of emotions, so to speak being finally happy, being finally with the people 
we love, at least metaphorically speaking, at least that perhaps more. We will get to that, but um, that is such a beautiful notion and I absolutely love how that is done. And of course, the third thing is almost the same, but a bit different because paradise, like this association I have is more like there's happiness when we get there, but the other is the afterlife. So the Christian afterlife, at least, and the Jewish, I think, and the Muslim, I think, as well. I'm not that sure. Perhaps I'm wrong on that one. But there's like an afterlife. And this afterlife is where they are going as well. They're going to Aureola. They are literally going to the afterlife, to, the, to heaven. Like th That's their journey. So when, when the blue sky is there, it also means they're on their path. They are going for, the, for their aim. They are, they are doing what they can to reach what they want. Like, like, it's, like it's a basic storyline or story device. Uh, going for what you want and um, overcoming obstacles on the way and growing as a person. Like that's basically the framework for every story that exists, if it's a good one, I, I feel. If you disagree, I would love to know in the comments. So um, it is basically the, the goal of the story is always there. And in a way, heaven is always there in the background. Like that's where they're going for. They're going for heaven. They want to reconnect with the dead. Like the dead are such an important part of this, of this anime, and that is why this is also such a wow. Like, like how how cool is it that this one word Himmel encapsulates those three very core themes of the show? I absolutely love it. Also, the design Himmel has, like, he's a bit dreamy. Like, he's in heaven. Like, um, and there's a saying in German which is like. Uh, being in the seventh heaven, like it's it's this is that's the literal translation. I don't think there is. There's probably an English uh, uh, version, but it's different. But in German, you would say we are in the seventh heaven if we are like in complete bliss and and like if everything's like a dream. And that is the way he comes off in most scenes when he's talking to Frieden. Like he's this calm guy that's a bit dreamy, head in the clouds. Yes, I know, <laughs> stupid pun, but it's true as well. And his design, like he's blue, he has got the, I don't know what that is called that he has here, but he's got like some bird here, like freedom, like, like flying towards the sky. And um, he, his design encapsulates that so well as well. And yeah, th this, this is the first one as well, as I said, because this is really, really important. Himmel is not only there as a character, but as a theme and as an artistic choice. The night sky and the clear sky at day, like the clear sky, basically. If, if the sky darkens, if there are clouds, there's almost always in the story something that is an obstacle hindering us, clouding our view to the goal. And most striking in, I think, in a Schwer Mountains, where Frieren collapses because there's just a snowstorm. She can't see the sky anymore. She just collapses. I know it's cold and it, there's an in-universe explanation as well but that is something i got from it as well and i really love that himmel is such a such a well named character and he embodies this theme of sky of bliss that is about to come hopefully and of the goal you have going for like those three things he encapsulates perfectly and i love it it is so well done so Tell me if you found more cool Himmel scenes and Himmel glances and uh, I would love to uh, hear about them. And I will look out for that on Core 2 as well. So let's see where that goes. Aizen. So Aizen. So there's an E and an I. And uh, in German, that those two together are all, almost like 99% pronounced I. Like you would in English probably write AI, that sound, but it is I. So Eisen means as someone who plans a lot, who knows the whole... No, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's, I, I'm sorry I had to make the bleach joke. Anyway, so Eisen means iron. Um, Eisen is a, is a dwarf. Of course he is. And that makes him... I'm not actually that sure. It was only teased a bit. Like it was teased twice. And the last three episodes, I think, it was teased that Eisen is very sturdy, has lots of stamina, so he's like a piece of iron. Um, 
He's a warrior. He's got um, high durability. He's long lived, like iron is. Like it, it will rust in the end, but and and Eisen, of course, rusts, so to speak, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, he's this. He's this iron warrior. He also has this philosophy of like, 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 like being, being strong and having lots of stamina and like the way he taught Stark to like stand up again, stand up again, like this, this, the stamina thing, this willpower he has, which is absolutely awesome. I absolutely love it. The, the willpower he has, he still honors his parents, is still with them. Um, so he's uh, also something very persistent uh, in time as Eisen is a bit. Um, so I like that a lot. Um, he does melt sometimes, <laughs> and uh, uh, I love those moments as well. I feel though he is the one of the three that Frieren traveled with. We know the least amount of, and most we know about him is through Stark's flashbacks and through the talks he had with Frieren in the early episodes. So I hope that we will get more Eisen. But the Eisen we got, awesome stuff. I love Eisen. I'm also glad he's still alive. Uh, some people have said he might die and be an Aureole so Stark can meet him. I hope he's not. I hope Stark will, in the end, come back to Eisen and tell him his stories. And uh, I would love that. Um, Eisen, of course, has Eisen, uh, like Iron Armor around himself, I think, as well. And. Um, yeah, there. Also, he was very um, hard when they started. I think, I, I, I think, I might. Ah, oh, no, I might misremember. If I do, shout at me in the comments, of course. I think he was the one that said, "Why have fun on an adventure?" I, I think it was him. Um, and then Himmel's like, "Yeah, why not? <laughs> why we are on it? Why not have fun?" So he was hard as well, hardened. And with time, he goes soft. He rusts, so to speak, but in a positive way. And as I said, he rusts as well because he grows weaker and uh, gets old as well. So that is very sad. Um, but that is basically all I actually have to say about him. I would love to know more about him, but he feels... I don't know, with Himmel and Heiter, I had two very big oof moments, um, both in their death, but also metaphorically because, for example, the Himmel, like we see the Himmel all the time. He's there. Like I love that. Um, but um, yeah, that's Eisen, and uh, that's all I would say there is to say about him. So if you know more, please, please tell them in the comments. I, I don't know. Yes, Haita the priest, our corrupt priest. Um, it's a bit like Eisen, like there's an E and an I, so he's Haita. Um, you would pronounce it Haiter with the R, like, like uh, audible in the end. But it's the same with Frieren, like a normal colloquial German, you would probably say Haita, like with an A. So that's completely fine. Everyone will know what you mean. And Haiter was the first one where I had to take a break and digest what I what I learned because it blew me away and I don't know if it will be the same for you. Perhaps it will be like for you, yeah, I, that's, that's remotely interesting. I don't really care. But for me, this was one of the coolest realizations and it did make me appreciate the anime and the art style a lot more. And it was the first time I really felt like, wow, this is a genius writing and, and a drawing this and I'm in love with this. I love Brian so much. and um. I did talk about Haita's meaning, of course, in the reactions, as I did with the others. But Haita was, man, I missed some, some, some meanings. And I knew the meanings I missed, like what, what Haita means. And I knew them. And when I read them, I was like, yeah, of course, but how does that fit? Oh, God, it fits so perfectly. So Haita has three meanings. The first meaning is Haita means jolly. And that's the one I already gave you, I think. And um, he's basically like, like a feel-good man. He's always jolly. He's always wearing a smile or, or being like, oh, ho, 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 
when there's a funny moment with him, like when he's on screen, there's often like a joke and and it's a light-hearted atmosphere. And he's, so to speak, uh, the kind soul of the group, the, the one who, who makes them laugh, who brings a good mood into the adventure. And I absolutely love him for that. And uh, I think that alone would make Hyde a very, very apt name. And I'm sorry, I might be biased. He's actually my, he's my favorite character. <laughs> he's my favorite character. I said it here. I'm sorry. So I might be biased, but I love every second he's on screen, both in his young version when he's like, like very openly jolly, like laughing, drinking a bit, like, like about having a good time. And also when he ages up, becomes wiser. Um, just has this kind smile on his face. His design as well, I will talk about that here a bit when he's old, like he's got these uh, ring wrinkles that like, like tell he smiled a lot in his life and and he's in, he's turned in the end into a kind old man, very thoughtful, but also brings a bit of hope into the world with being like, yeah, the afterlife would be convenient, like, and and I hope someone praises you. Like, there's this very feel good thing about him, and I absolutely love Heiter for that. And as I said, he's my favorite character. Um, yeah, so that's like the meaning I also gave in the episode. It perfectly fits. It's so well done. So, anyway, now we come to the second meaning, and the second meaning is also something I. I thought about it after the reaction, but I never talked about it because I wanted to talk about it here. So um, in Germany, let's say you go to a party and you drink like one or two drinks, like you don't get wasted or anything, but you drink some drinks and you become very like talkative and happy. That is called being heiter. Um, you also say angeheitert, so heitert, so to speak, like a bit, it doesn't really fit like the, the English language uh, gra grammar here, but like that that is also also his name it's Haita it's being a bit tipsy like Haita means tipsy as well so it makes a lot of sense that he, he drinks so much like it's his theme that's why he's and because as i said you might disagree with this but as he's this fairy tale character who embodies like these themes like he's if you see him as a walking theme that's why he always has the the something to drink with him because that's his theme as well it's the same as you would um uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 you would expect Snow White to have black hair. Like, that's the same as you would expect Heiter to have a drink now, if you understand the name. It's so funny and it's so brilliantly done. And I love, for example, the, the scene when they raid the dragon's nest after he's defeated and Friedrich looks at the bottle or when Heiter has the bottle with him um, when he meets Fern. Like, like it, it's this... It's being drunk, but still feeling positive about it. Like this very, very positive connotation of being tipsy. Like he's the guy who everyone remembers from the party. He's like the, the positive point of the party. Oh God, I just realized that of the party. They're an adventure part. And, and he's the feeling good part of the party. Like if you drink. Wow. Okay. See, sometimes these things come to me when I speak. That's why I do this, like, freestyle. I, like, <laughs> I write, write uh, barely anything down for these as just bullet points. So, so I learned something new about Hydra. Like, he's the, he's the, he's the feel-good person on the party. Ah, anyway. <laughs> oh, that is so good. Anyway, um, yeah. The third... Third meaning is what blew me away. And I thought about it a bit, but I did not connect the dots. I didn't. I thought it was not applicable, this meaning. So it is the third meaning Heiter has. So we have all the Heiter meanings in German are uh, there in his character. Like what? And, and the third meaning is um, a sunny, good day is Heiter. Like, if you ask, how is the weather going to be? It's going to be heiter. So there's got, like, either few clouds or none, and it's very sunny, and it's, like, also this feel-good weather. I would translate it as feel-good weather as well. And then it hit me, and thank you so much to uh, Chris, uh, age 43. You brought this up. I didn't connect the dots when you brought it up. Um, and this blew my mind. Heiter, when Heiter's alive and he's on the screen, there are sun rays. 
every single time I, I watched it. I, I was like, this can't be. There is the scene where he's like in his shorts sunbathing and I laughed my ass off at that. But like it, the sun, like like he's not uh, he's not sunbathing because there's sun, but the sun is there because he's there. That's the point. And and I was like, no no no, this is just a coincidence. And then I, I went back. And in episode two, every time Frieren and Fen are alone, it's not like that. But every time Heiter is there and it's not inside at night, there is sun rays coming. And when he collapses and loses consciousness, the weather changes in the anime. It starts raining. Like he's subconscious, it rains. Like Heiter's gone. Wow, what the fuck was that? I was like, this can't be. And then he wakes up again and the sun is back. And then he dies. And what would you expect now to happen? A bad writer would have made like, yeah, okay, no sunny weather anymore. But this writer is awesomely brilliant. And the same way Himmel is with them in shots when they show the blue sky, there's sunny sky all the time. So not even Himmel is with Frieren all the time, Heiter is as well. And if you watch the anime, there are many, many scenes where she remembers him uh, or when she does something where there are sun rays. Like when she is praying for the fallen souls like Heiter would have done where, after the aura battle, like there are the sun rays. Or every time she uh, really speaks about him, there are sun rays coming down. And that blew my mind. And it also explains why the sky we see is always perfectly blue. Because it is a Heiter sky. It is a Heiter Himmel. Heiter and Himmel together. That's the symbolism. It is not just Himmel, the blue sky. It's Heiter and Himmel. And when I realized that, I was like, what the fuck? Are you serious? Like, that was so mind-blowing to me. I don't know if it is to you. Perhaps you're like, yeah, okay, fine. Drew some blue sky and that's also a Heiter sky. Like, And it also tells me in the story, like, like when Frieren thinks about them, like, she took something with them, uh, from them with her. And that's a theme in some episodes, like taking something from the dead with you. And I think it's in episode two where they talk about it as well, like learning from them and taking the spirit with you a bit. And she does. She already does that. She has the clear sky. She takes Heiter and Himmel with her on the journey. And sometimes the sky gets cloudy. And she like disconnects with them a bit. And often it is also that in these scenes, there's some disconnect or something she doesn't understand or some insecurity or something like that. And that is symbolism beyond brilliance to me. And I love it. So Heiter as clear sky is a sunny day. If you rewatch this, watch for the sun rays. You will be blown away by that. The, the attention to detail there is perfect. Like, that was the first, as I said, so I think we're done with Hydra now. Yeah, I think we are. So that is, that is the point where I realized this is more than just names. Like, because I, I knew Himmel was there and I thought, yeah, okay, I mean, he was her, her potential friend or lover. Of course, they go for him, like they go for Himmel, for heaven. But no, it is not only that they go for heaven, it is that they take their friends already with them. And subconsciously, it also tells me that Frieren connected with both of them already. She just has to learn and reflect on it and work through her grief. And, and that is symbolized so well through this artistic choice. And if I could, like, I, I would, like, I would, uh, if I ever meet the author, I would, like, be, you know what, drink all the beer with me you want. Like, you deserve all the beer. I know it's German. But, man, I love that. Like, it, it, it is, it is. Like that was one of the best things. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so flabbergasted by it still now thinking about it. Like Heiter is probably like, like, like the way all the three meanings that Heiter has and they are in his character and they fit together and it is done so well and nuanced and layered and subtle as well. It is brilliant. Anyway, let's go to the next one. <laughs> The Era Meteor Shower. So um, I think they misspelled it, at least in my Crunchyroll subs, they had E-R-A. That's wrong. In German, you would have an A. That's what this is called. Like if an A has the two, two, uh, 
<laughs> two bits of uh, a fly shit above it. Um, it's called eh. It's like a bit like you would uh, be like if you're like eh. I'm sorry, it's a stupid sound. I'm gonna make it again. Eh. Please don't clip it. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, that's like era. Uh, it is. It is the same as in English. Almost, it's an era. Um, the the meteor shower, which is like something meteor showers often are like cyclical. This one is 50 years. And the 50 years are the era where Frieren disconnects from her friends or like not fully disconnects, but starts to forget her relationships. Like first we have the era of the heroes and of their journey. Then we have the era of forgetting and regret. And then we have the era of looking for, for the things lost. and um, it is a meteor shower. Uh, shooting stars often stand for wishes as well. Like you wish on the future, you hope for a better future. And uh, in this case, it is probably in the end um, gonna be a me meteor shower again where they are. I could see, I could see it. Yeah, perhaps I'm not that sure. But but tell me what you think. Would it be cool in the end if if Frieren and Fern and Stark and Sein are under the sky? And the Era Meteor Show will be there as well again. And it will be another situation and they will really, really take in that moment. Anyway, um, it's just a small thing, but uh, yeah, it means era. Um, age, so to speak. So, then we have the holy city of Stral. Um, Stral means ray. Um, it can be several things. It's not several. It can be two things, actually. I'm sorry. So it can be a ray of light. That's the most, or, or energy, um, a beam of energy. That's what I would associate with it firstly. Um, it fits because, of course, it is the, as far as I understood, I might have not gotten that correctly. It's the main capital of the priests and of the goddess belief. So like this religious light theme is there with the capital, like it's a strahl, like it's it's a ray, the ray of light that comes forth. Um, and uh, the blessings come from there. And something also a bit more abstractly, and you might be again like, yeah, he's talking out of his behind, but um, it's something from mathematics actually. So I don't know. In German, a strahl in mathematics is a construct um, where you have a dot, and from that dot, there goes a line into infinity. So it's the start of infinity, so to speak. And you might, into, or, or going forward, like a starting point, and then you go forward. And it's, the, it's where they start their journey. It's where they start their journey when they were uh, Eisen, Heiter, Himmel, and Frieren. If, when they started their journey, they were at the capital Strahl, and then they went onwards, onwards. And then the story went onwards and onwards in their journey. That could also be an interpretation. Um, let me know what you think if that's reaching. It might be, again, it might be reaching. All of this might be reaching, but I really like that as well. And it was a jolly, like, like light city. Like it has this association of, of, of good in a way, because there they get the task of killing the demon king, which is a bad thing. So of course they're good. And uh, that's about what I can say about the holy city of Strahl. Yeah, I did that on purpose, sorry. Fern. Okay, so Fern is another big character. Um, Fern is, of course, uh, the apprentice of Haita and like the grandchild of Haita, so to speak, and the apprentice of Frien. And uh, Fern means um, distance. Um, fern again is F E R N, so it is uh, pronounced Fern because the E again is uh, pronounced E in German. And um, some people have pointed out that in English it sounds like uh, a fern um, or, or it is spelled like fern, so the plant. And in German, that plant, by the way, would be spelled Fern, so it's almost the same as well. So I get the confusion, but yeah, so. so uh, Fern means uh, distant, remote, and uh, far away. Like, those are the associations I get from her. It's also a bit in her design, like, she looks a bit distant, spaced out. We don't really get into her head. Um, 
For example, little detail uh, in the Lugner fight, someone pointed it out. Lugner talked a lot in his own head, but we never saw Fern's perspective even show. So he would probably be the person we expect to to hear the thoughts of. Um, I don't actually think we've ever heard her thoughts, but I might completely misremember that, and I'm very, very sorry if I do. But please confirm or deny it. That would be interesting. It would fit as well. Like she's fan like, distant because we don't really f see her perspective as well. Would be genius. I don't know if the author did that. Knowing him, he probably did. But uh, yeah, we sometimes hear her talk, also personal stuff. But that's the only thing we get from her. She also, of course, uses range magic to an awesome extent. Love her for that. Uh, the way she absolutely, <laughs> absolutely loaded uh, Lugna was so, so satisfying. She just, she just fucked him so badly and not in the good way. Love that. Um, she's also distant to people. Um, she wants Frieren to get to know her. She probably connects a bit with Frieren as well, which is interesting because if you're distant, you are Frieren. Like, like, like that's very, those two concepts are very close. And they are the first ones who start the journey. So those are aspects that are go that go together often thematically, like being distant, being cold. Like that is a very, very nice thing. Um, so um, so that's why they connect a bit together, like with each other. And that's that, that that's very, very interestingly done, and I like that. So you might say, yeah, uh, those two uh, together, like it doesn't really fit their names, but towards everyone else they fit. And what really is cool as well is that um, Fern is distant to Stark as well. Like she always puts something between them. Sometimes she pretends that she's this good person or this non-pervert, which is something like Stark is accused of by her a lot. And she often puts distance between them, even though sometimes she closes that distance or Stark has to close it. So she learns and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that is uh, basically uh, uh, the fan stuff. Um, tell me if you uh, have more about her, uh, but I think that's her main characteristic. She's also distant, remote, doesn't con connect that well to people, perhaps as well a bit because she thinks she's a bit better than them. Like very, very, very um, little though only, like not a lot. Like I don't really get that vibe a lot from her, but sometimes it comes up. And uh, yeah, like she puts distance between people and her as well. So uh, anyway. Yes, Evik. That one was also awesome. Um, Evik is uh, something eternal. And of course that does um, correspond to the book they read that was apparently written by someone called Evik who was said to research immortality, eternal life. So um, it is basically they try to, to understand that concept and apply it to Heiter to make him live eternally. Um, of obviously, in the end, it da didn't work really. Um, so that was a bit sad, but I really like that. It was just a small thing. I don't know if he will come up again, um, but it's a, it's a very cool word, actually, ewig. Uh, and the the W is, uh, by the way, in German, it's pronounced V. So a bit like a V, but a bit less um, sharply, colorfully. I don't even know what to say, like uh, the V and not a V. Like it's just the first part of the V. So uh, yeah, E, V. And again, the E being pronounced E. E, V. Um, yeah, sometimes you say also ewig. Like the G is sometimes like sometimes do that in normal language as well. So if you hear someone saying ewig, yeah, that's the same thing. They mean this. Um, I really like it. It's it's also something um, something. Um, and this is also I wouldn't even say it's reaching because I know it is. Like it's nothing really really essential, but it's it's a funny funny coincidence, perhaps more like that. Let's call it that that um, Frieren reads the book and translates it and tries to grapple with immortality and understand it. And uh, that's what she does in real life a bit as well. But again, this is just a funny thing. It's not even that I say it's what intent was intended. Just, just a thought I had.
together with it, like nothing like sub substantial. And with that, we are through episode one, and I've only been recording for an hour. So uh, let's see where we are, where we go, because there are two very, very heavy hitters coming up also. So let's see how long this is. I hope you have some popcorn. Anyway, so episode two does not have any German names I saw. So let's just go to episode three. Yeah, so first it's the city of Warm. And um, yeah, I mean, that's warm. Like it's the same. It's basically the same spelling. Fun fact, you probably don't care. You will give it anyway. When I learned English, it was one of the first words I learned. And I instantly memorized it because, of course, it's written the same. And I did not have to like understand the TH or something that I was very unfamiliar with. And I still can't really pronounce V. <laughs> anyway. That was a weird tangent, but you know I do that. Um, yeah, I, I think there are two things I associate with warm. Like one's the one is the real warmth, like being warm, and also like warming up. And um, it is basically the first real stop of their journey. So Frieren starts to warm up. So her um, her journey starts. She gets a bit warmer. The coldness in her soul starts to diminish a bit. Um, she also warms up to Fern, giving her the butterfly, understanding her. And it's a very lovely name for the, the journey she's on. Um, also, something interesting uh, uh, is that um, um, uh, the, this, this theme of warmth will come up later with the character, of course. And... If you know my reactions, you know which one I'm talking about, but you have to wait a bit till we get there to that character. But yeah, like like it's 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 a very nice symbolic start of the journey they really have. Like it's the first time they're at a place, they connect with, with each other. Um Fan understands that Frieren does care about her. Frieren gifts her the 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 hair thing. Um, which is her butterfly that is the first magic the she ever produced. It's the reason why she loves magic. It is because her parent, Heiter, loved that spell so much and it's core of her. And Frieren connects with Fern, gifting her that hair thing and um, warms up a bit to her as well. So I think those are the associations I had here. Perfectly fitting place. I really love that. Größe Forest. So this one's fun. And there are two, two weird things in this in Größe. Um, of course, the first is the Ö. Yeah, I did it again. It's not the Ä, it's the Ö. So it's an O with two bits of fly shit above it. Um, and then there is this weird thing. And uh, it is basically... Um, it's a remnant from older German, and they actually tried to erase this character in, I think, 2000, 1960, 1969, something around, in the 90s, like, in the 90s, there was a um, grammar and spelling uh, reform uh, in Germany, and they tried to erase this character. It stayed. Um, it is rarely used, and uh, it is pronounced, it's like an S. It's a very sharp S you make. Um, I think the, the shape is from uh, an old way of writing the S itself. And it's just, yeah, this S is very, very, like, hissy. Like, um, it is called, um, there are several names for it in, uh, in German. I will uh, now give you the names that people call it. And you can just pick one. So this could be Buckel S, which is like a hunching S, so to speak, uh, literally translated. It is called SZ, which is uh, like translated as Z. Um, or, uh, yeah, it is called a sharp S. Like people call it a sharp S as well. So don't be confused by it. Um, it is, uh, I think it is only uh, used after one vo vowel. If there's one vowel in front of like something, uh, like an S that is very sharp. You write this one. If there is uh, two vowels or none, um, 
you will write 2s instead. It's a weird thing. Don't know why they do it. Um, people in Germany have problems sometimes with that as well. So if you had problems with this in school or anything, like don't worry, people have it all the time. Um, we learned that. I, I think it was it was hard for some of my peers to learn in primary school as well. And I mean, because language learning and spelling was like for Germans, it's in primary school. If you learn the language, it's probably secondary school. So it's like, you know, but um, yeah. So Größe means uh, like character, like proving your character, proving that you're capable, uh, but also uh, proving that you live up to your ideals. Um, I've discussed this with some people. Some people said, no, no, it's, it means great. like. But that's not true. Gross. I put it here. Gross means great. And uh, Größe means more like greatness, greatness of character. And you might argue that, no, they, they, meant, they meant gross because the forest is big. So gross, like that's what it means, big. Um, but I disagree because of the intricacies they put into the other German words, like heiter and stuff. Like someone really knew their German and they would not make a mistake like this. So it is. Um, proving greatness, proving your character, like that is what Größe means. Like, like Größe is like that, like this, this greatness you can have is in your character, and it fits because Fern is proving her capabilities at this place, if I re recall correctly. With Qual, her first battle, she proves herself; she can defend herself against this demon. Like it's her first test, her first battle. I, I think they might have trained there as well with the weird zombie thing that they encountered her first real battle. I'm not sure though, uh, might have been in Größe Forest as well, but it's a very apt name for um, for a first success story of uh, of uh, of Fern. Yes, Qual. Um, Qual means Something like torment, agony, lasting, heart pain. Um, I don't really know, but for me personally, and this might just be my impression, and I said as much in my reactions as well, Qual is a very specific kind of agony and torment. Like it is really this, this, this. It's a state of being. It's like, I might know the terms agony and torment not enough to be able to be like, yeah, that's the same, but it's very, very close. But I always feel qual is more terrible than agony and torment. Um, because for me, qual is associated with the worst type of pain. And this type of pain is what you are at the moment. Like it's it's very weird. I can hardly describe it. But that's like my my uh, yeah. Let's let's learn a new word. Language Sprachgefühl. It's a German word. Sprachgefühl. It means language feeling. So sometimes you don't know really why stuff in your language exists or why it is like that or why you associate stuff. In Germany, we would say uh, you have a Sprachgefühl. You have a feeling for your language, so to speak. And if you uh, are in a German class and want to really show your teacher who's the boss, you can use this and be like, but my Sprachgefühl is not exactly like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. Um, I mean, of course, Qual uh, means something like torment and stuff because he basically rips out souls of people. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a lot to say there, I, I have to say. Um, like, he's someone that's evil. There's malevolence in him. He's a state of destruction, I think. So destruction causes qual, causes torment and agony. Fitting name for a demon. And um, yeah, I, I really liked qual. His design is well. Like, he's got the horns. I, has he horns? Oh, God, I'm sorry. There will be a picture of, of him somewhere, but he's got horns, I think. So very fitting, um, very fitting design as well for this. And um, also the way he was as a character, like he was very calculated and interested, but like in a very sinister way, I love that. And um, yeah. Zoltrak. Yeah, this is not a German word, I know, 
Um, it is, as far as people in the comments have told me, it is um, thorough track. It's an English word. Um, that might be because it is a newer spell and they, they use English for um, more, more li like, um, I think they use English actually for uh, things that are like legendary terms in stories. So like the Sword Village, for example, or um, Soul Track or a Gorilla Warrior, like that are the mystical names that they give stuff in universe, but that are not necessarily the core of the Frieren fairy tale, if you if you ascribe to my theory of all of this being a fairy tale. Like it's a it's a fairy tale name in a fairy tale, so to speak. You know what I what I mean? So uh, it is something they named in universe. Like it's not uh, Frieren or Himmel, those are names that come from the story. They develop through it. They are um, expressions of the core themes of the story themselves. Um, but not these English words that are there. They're also like mystical words, uh, but they are like, they're given from the characters in the story to things. And Himmel is not something, I think, if, if this is correct with the fairy tale stuff, that someone in universe gave that name. It's just something that appears because of the story and its themes. I hope that made sense. So it is probably Soul Trek and he called it that, so it's English and it would make sense. I just wanted to say that there are might be something in German like it. Like, there is no word that is similar. Um, but in Germany, and I wanted to bring this part of German culture into this as well, um, there is this uh, thing in German you can do, which is called Wort Neuschöpfung. And I know that's a long and weird sounding word. It basically means a, word, a new word creation or creation of a new word. Um, in Germany, you can sometimes take other, uh, take other words and like, smash them together and they make, make sense. Like you will understand what they mean together. Um, and um, like, uh, what do we have? Um, uh, you, you might have uh, 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 someone who's fishing and you might have a pond, so you might call it fishing pond. I know that works, but like it's this, this thing. Like that's something that almost always works in German. And I do that sometimes as well. Like if you see it in my reaction, sometimes I, I, I do it in English and it might be weird for you, but I sometimes like create new words from fragments of other words that are associated with the situation. And that is called a Wort Neuschöpfung. So if someone is like, in, in, again, you're, if, you're, if your German teacher is like, no, this is not a German word. Like those are two words, you can't just mush them together and you will be like, it's a Wort Neuschöpfung, I can do it. Germans do it all the time. And that is really the case. Like you could make that argument. The teacher probably couldn't really say anything actually if they know German. So that's a life hack in German. So you learned that here and you didn't think you would learn something like that in this video. <laughs> anyway, so we are at Soul, Soul, uh, Soul Trek. Um, so the first part at Zoll or Soll, which are both German words. So it's the first part. Um, Zoll is... Um, that what you pay when you have to ship goods across a border, like it's the 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 toll you pay, or or the it is the price you pay to be allowed to transport something or go a certain way, like toll, um, and um, or the other word zoll is uh, like have to, like a forcing word. It has to be like, or 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 it should be. So those are words that exist in German, and the first part is very very close to those two words. And the last is uh, Trak, um, uh, which is Trak, which is um, uh, um, uh, a word particle associated with carrying. So um, uh, forcing someone to carry something is something that would make sense in German. And I actually thought about this a lot and I don't think it works. I I'm sorry, I, I just... I hope you didn't waste your time here with like, but but there's like there's a word that sounds like something German, and it would be a, you would be able to say that, but it doesn't make and it makes sense. Like it would be a word someone would understand, but the problem is it doesn't apply to soul track here. And I think the English explanation is a lot better here because Qual named it soul track, and um, because it tracks the souls and detects them and. Um, I don't think, yeah, yes, and he named it. And um, I think it's different to a text like um, um, the things Lugner or others use later because they did not name them. They understood their techniques, but quite developed it, I think. It is iffy. I know it's iffy, and I would love to hear your opinions on this, but that's my feeling. 
I haven't really grasped the English stuff in this uh, fairy tale, but that is, uh, that's my two cents on the matter. So now we're almost one and a half hour in and we're already at episode four of 16. God. I should, have, I should have split this up. I knew it would be long. I'm so sorry. I hope you're still there and watching. Um, anyway, I, like, so I would do this as a live premiere as well. And I will just use this occasion very shortly to say thank you all for being at the live premieres, uh, talking with me a bit. It is such a pleasure. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, for having suggested this anime and for talking about it with me and being so kind and never any vitriol or everyone can ask their questions and their opinions and thank you so much for being an awesome community and I love the free and community thank you so much and as well as I said if if there's if, if you know people who would be interested in this video share it post it to them please di distribute it I normally don't say this but like this took a lot of work and research so um perhaps spread it and let people know these things. So anyway, so we are now at the Glanz Kanal, which is, of course, uh, the first place where we hear about Flamme in the story. Um, so uh, Glanz is something very, very vaguely um, associated with, um, with uh, burning, very vaguely, like a, f a very far off distant light. Anyway, I digress. Glanz means um, glow or shining like something that's shining um and i would associate jewels shining like something like that like a very beautiful sparkling as well why is it called that um two things first of course the visuals when they clean the coast from the wreck like the, when they clean the wreckages and the the rubbish away after they are staying there and there is this beautiful sunset that like shimmers and the sun rises, which is another very, very important thing, like the Heiter and Himmel stuff in the background, the third most important, like the third important theme that is artistically always there in very important stuff. And this was like sun rising, journey starting again, and um a beauty starting to appear again in Frieren's life. I assume, that's what I got from it a bit. And her starting to realize the small things and um, seeing something mundane uh, uh, shining, seeing fan shining. And I absolutely love that Sun's, uh, sunrise was a brilliant, brilliant scene. Um, I also like the culture of honoring the sunrise. Um, it is basically from a psychological point, I would most say that it is mostly honor uh, setting new goals and going forward. That is like because celestial bodies often um, have a meaning of a goal, like like sun or the the moon as well. Uh, often have this theme of main goals of your life, or. Um, looking up and seeing where you should be, what could be, like the most important stuff that could be. That's the sun and the moon symbolism. And no, that is not why you should, should have looked for the sun and the moon, as I said in the reactions. It's not that. It's just the symbolism that there is as well. So celestial bodies, sun rising is um, starting to realize your goals, to go for them. And... Uh, Fits a bit as well because I think they stayed there for three months or something. So they start their journey again, but they were rewarded with something beautiful. At least Frieren was. She was rewarded with Fern's smile, with connecting to her. And again, this connection makes the, the sky light up and Himmel is there again. And um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful scene. And the sun is, as I said, an important symbol. As is the moon for the same reason, but at night. Um, but the moon is more important, actually. But we will get to that. And uh, I absolutely love this. Like, they also made a mistake in the, uh, uh, the Crunchyroll um, uh, uh, subs, at least the ones I used. They said, oh no, I think it's even on the screen. So it's, uh, they said Granz Kanal, but it's Glanz Kanal with an L. Glanz Kanal. And there's again R 
gla glans. So it's not glans, it is glans. Um, yeah, and the Z of course in the end as well. Brettregion. Brettregion is weird because Brett, the way it's written, is not German. Um, but it is probably supposed to be Brett. So not one D and a T, but two T's. And then it means plank. Um, it's the plank, uh, plank region. I don't know why. I think some comments have told me that there, like, planks are produced there. And uh, if we take, again, the, um, the, the fairy tale interpretation of someone telling the story, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know what? There was this forest. There were planks in it. It's like the main thing I remember. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's, it's I don't know. Um, so this one was short, but it's like, I think it's, um, it's where um, 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 Eisen lived. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I already, it was so unimportant, but uh, yeah. Voll Bazin. Um, voll is, of course, full. And we will have Fall again with Old Man Fall in the end, of course. Um, similar meanings, but um, we will discuss the Fall Bazin here first. It is the place where the grimoire is hidden that points us towards Aureola. And um, several like, like associations with the name Fall uh, were in my mind when I watched these scenes for the first time. The first, of course, it's that... <laughs> they, they searched and there were too many trees like they, they were like oh it's in the tree but there are so many trees like it's it's full of trees the forest is full of trees so if i would recall the story and tell it to someone i would, I would be like yeah then we were in this forest it was so full of trees it was the full forest like you know it's at least that's my head cannon a bit and again might disagree what i found that funny um it is also full of knowledge that is because the grimoire is there, the only real grimoire flamme ever left behind that we know of. And that is for a reason, and I will dive into that down the line. Um, I think I know why, but yeah. So um, yeah, Fall Bazin is um, full of knowledge, uh, full of um, importance. And um, in German colloquial language so like if i would talk on the street and i would be a little bit gangster <laughs> oh god if i would be a bit gangster i would be like a uh, fall cool like fall is in this um sense also uh, full but also very very like uh, like it's an it's a, it exaggeration um so um um, you would say you would I associate that with positivity as well fall cool fall 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 nice like you would say that like that's like I'm not making this up like it, it sounds weird but we use this uh, English German mix there in in colloquial uh, language so we say fall cool or <laughs> or see I'm sorry it's <laughs> it, it's mixing a bit now in my in my head the languages so fall nice, fall cool. Like, you could say that in Germany and you would be understood perfectly. Like, everyone would think you're a normal German. So, um, like, but, but, but it's like, um, or, or, or fall imp or important, fall wichtig. Like, fall important. That's something you would say. Uh, so, fall also means very. The very bizarre, the very something. Um, don't know if that helps, but um, that is what it is. So, uh, I think those are two reasonable interpretations. I'm also a bit shaky on those, like interpretation wise, but it means full or in colloquial slang, uh, very. Like it's, a, it's, the, it's the thing that has very. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, now you are uh, uh, probably gonna be like, finally, we get the one we were waiting for. And you are right. We are at. Yes, Flamme, the legendary mage. Um, my second favorite character as well. Um, I absolutely love Flamme. And um, there are several, several reasons for that. But um, let's again first uh, talk about the German. Um, Flamme means flame. 
so a piece of fire. Um, quickly, we will get uh, over uh, to her design. Of course, like big red hair, her head looks like a flame, and uh, she uh, has, uh, I would say, a lot of passion for magic, um, a lot of power for magic. She's got a lot of knowledge, which the flame is also symbol for. Like, uh, for example, Prometheus stole a flame of fire uh, from the gods to bring humans knowledge. So her as a teacher being called Flamme Flame is utterly, utterly brilliant. And um, Flame also is a symbol of power because she's the most powerful mage. A human mage. Uh, it also is um, very interestingly uh, knowing her and teach, uh, being taught by her, thaws Frieren a bit. Like the connection she forms with Flamme thaw starts thawing her a bit. So the flame starting to thaw Frieren um, also very symbolic. And and there are several places in the story where I found evidence for. Frieren having connected with Flamme a lot, and Flamme probably being the only person in the world uh, Frieren feels connected to and that she understands. Um, there are her earrings. I know you all wanted me to talk about that, but yes, that's it. Like the 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 moment he goes on the adventure, um, she puts on her red earrings. Uh, it's a bit of flame in her freezing like design, and. Um, like her earrings are a spark, like the spark of adventure she, she gets. Like it starts thawing her. It starts putting away the distance she had built over a thousand years. Uh, it starts igniting her wish for the journey to kill the demon king again because she was like just living in a forest and she finally was like, yes, now I can do it. Now I will do it. She puts on the earrings. She starts being passionate for something or not even passionate. Like she starts to burn for something again. Um, uh, other things uh, that Flamme um, has that Frieren carries with her. The same way, by the way, she carries Heiter and Himmel, she carries Flamme. Again, mind-blowingly brilliant. The earrings, the most striking thing. But also, there is a rainbow, I think, about around her Zoltschrak sometimes. So she took a part of Flamme as well into the Zoltschrak. And it's only a very, very small part because... I think she did not really completely understand that part of Flamme. I will get into that further down the line. She also adopted petting the head as being like as praising someone. It's also from Flamme, and um, I absolutely love that Flamme is this beautiful, beautiful character, a symbol for so much, and it is. She's such an integral part of the world building. I I don't know in Core Two, you know, you always. Keep that in mind. But in Core 1, she's like this, like, like she's humanity's flame. She ignited something in humanity, the magic. She ignited some, something in Frieren. Uh, she uh, ignited um, her will to go towards a goal. Uh, she ignited a, like a, a, a purpose in that she wants to kill demons. Like Flamme is this very, very dense concept that is marvelously portrayed in this show and she's probably one of like the the best best um realized concepts that has a name here as well and i also think she ignited the belief in uh, the goddess a bit because she goes to aureola and i this is just a theory or a hypothesis i don't know and perhaps it will be disproven later it might be it's just something i thought about um, and you will have seen it in my reactions when I thought about it, if you saw them, that she's probably the, perhaps she's the only one that was to Aureola. So she's the one that says the afterlife exists. And the priests might have believed in the goddess before, but that was the first evidence they had that they were not misguided. So in a way, she also might, might have, I, I'm not sure, this is just me spitballing, it might be incorrect. Please don't spoil it in the comments. As I read them, all of them, and I have not watched Core 2 or anything, so please don't spoil it. But I think it might be that she also ignited in part the spirituality and the the flame as a symbol of producing heat and light is also a symbol of enlightenment per se. 
doesn't have to be knowledge. It might also be religious beliefs or something like like a core or a passion burning. It's all something I associate with her and I absolutely love it. And uh, she seems to be the ultimate knowledgeable person and the way her magic works seems to be so strange because she can produce barriers that are thousands of years old and still hold. There are some people who have... Um, theorized in my comments that it might be that she uses trees to like like uh, continuously produce like like take mana or something that might be but there is probably also another thing to it which uh yeah i i i have some suspicion about but yeah so flamma is such an awesomely chosen character and next to himmel i think the name that has the most symbolic meaning and culturally as well. So I would actually be very interested in hearing your th your experiences in your cultures because I know there are you are from all over the world when you at least comment on the reaction videos. So what are cultural things that you associate with flames? It can also be something dangerous, like she burns demons down. Of course she does, but you know what? What are the positive aspects of her? I would love or flam of flames. I would love to see that. Uh, answered in the comments. So, uh, yeah, that was Flamma. Hello there, great person. So, if you're still watching this, you probably enjoy what I'm talking about in Frieren. So, you might enjoy me talking about some other cool topics as well, in a way, namely what being a parent means. And if you're interested in that, check out my new story, The Waters That Hated, which is now out as a free audiobook on Vidith 22's channel. He's probably the best voice actor on the internet. He read the story. It's pretty long and it plays out in a Korean town. So it's North Korea. It's around the Cold War. And the mother tries to protect her daughter from city and from sea because there are things lurking in the sea and there are things in the city's past that will also try to hunt her down, of course, because it's a bit horror, it's a bit tragedy and sadness and melancholy. So if you enjoy Frieren, you might enjoy it as well. So please check it out. It put a lot of work into it. And if you like me dealing with themes here, you can check out what I do myself with themes in a story. So be my guest, check it out. Also check out Vidith 22s channel in general. He's got brilliant stuff, as I said. So now we continue and now we finally get to Aureola. Yeah, so as I said, perhaps check out the story. Um, um, but yeah, we go to go to the most important thing, I think. And um I think in the reactions I said I don't know that word. I didn't know that word. I didn't think it was a word, it is a word in German. Aureole is a word in German. And it is so brilliant that I couldn't believe it. I thought, I think three days about this and stuff just popped up, stuff just popped up. It was bam, like this, this blew me away so, so much as well. So first the pronunciation, of course. So we start with au, an A and a U. It is um, pronounced au, like an ouch, like th that sound au. Uh, then we have RE, which is RE. So it is uh, RE again, not RE, RE, AU RE. And uh, if there is an E and an O, you pronounce them separately most of the time. Um, AU RE O LE. So um, that is how you pronounce it. And as I said, I did think it meant nothing. It was just a cool mystical word. And you cannot fault me for that because it is not a normal German word per se, uh, but it is a technical term. Um, and yes, I should have known it because it is a meteorological term. Me meteor me it's a weather science term and an astronomical term. And um, what an aureole is, it is the, it is the shining um, aura, so to speak, 
around a celestial body that you can see when there's the the air is not that clear like like it's almost like um the abstract version of a halo like or the generalized version of a halo like you know the sun has this halo around it that's also an aureole as far as i understood if i, I read it up i might be a bit wrong if someone knows better please correct me a bit but the fact that no one corrected me and told me what an aureole is in the comments tells me people might not be aware of this and you should be aware of this if you want to um, access some of the most brilliant, beautiful symbolism I've ever seen put onto a screen. Um, because, of course, the moon is a celestial body, and that, yes, that is it. Um, the aura around the moon, you see, like this, this, this light around the moon, that is an aureola. Um, so... Every time the full moon appears on screen, and the sun as well, um, Aureole is there. Um, and that might mean two things, because it is, like, it's basically a bit of a double meaning, I guess, because A, it is um, their goal, their final goal of the journey. So um, when we see the moon, very often it is a moment when when the goal is there, when, they, when there is determination. Almost the same as the sky, but it's there more often, I, I feel, because it's like the goal everyone has in the story. Uh, Fern has it, Frieren has it, Sein has it, and Stark has it. Like, I don't know if Sein has it, by the way. I still think his friend is dead. I don't know, but I assume he is, so he will have Aureola as a, as a goal as well. So every time someone gets determined, um, A, the moon sh uh, uh, is shown because, as I said, the moon is a symbol for your goals, so the goals clear up again, but it is so brilliantly, because the goal is also Aureola, so it is, like, combined with that. And um, it is also, as I said, it's a double meaning. It is also used a bit when, um, when talking about the dead when reminiscing of the people lost, also the idea of them looking down on us. Um, because, for example, when Granat, Granat, there's this, this, this th scene, and it blew me away. I didn't think it would be so intricate. So he looks at the moon with the aureole around it, and he's like, I remember my dead son. Like, now I think it's on the head. Like, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> but, like, I, I, I couldn't believe they put something like this and it's, like, one second, like, moon. And he talks about it. But it's so brilliantly done. Um, also, the first time I realized that there was something with the moon, it was when, um, when Fern goes to Stark and wants to um, convince him to fight the dragon. And Stark um, puts his, uh, makes, makes a fist and is like, okay, I'm going to do it. And that's the situation, like, we see the moon, and then he's, his resolve starts to be there. And um, we also know his brother's dead, so he's also there in the aureola looking for, out for him. Um, there are several other uh, instances where we see stars with aureolas around them, so the, I had to look that up. I was not sure, um, because it was not that clear in the, in the um, definitions I looked up. But yes... Around the star, there's also an aureola, you know? So the stars that are shining. So um, it actually, I, I realized that as well. Every time a child draws a star, not every time, they do it like with these uh, spikes. The spikes are basically the aureola, the symbol for the aureola. So it's not like they don't just put a dot down most of the time. They, 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 they paint the, like a part of the aureola. So it's important, culturally important that the stars shine. It's not just a sphere, it's a shining sphere. And there's meaning in that. And I absolutely loved it. So we had that, and it made me cry twice because I had realized, I think by episode 12 of, of 13, and then we had the scene with Stark's brother and we had in the end, the star that it twinkled, it shone. Aureola was there. It, 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 you can see it as perhaps he's really there in the stars or like magical somehow. And uh, Aureola can connect to the human world through the stars a bit. Um, or, uh, uh, yeah, um, you might say that. Or it is like figuratively he's watching over him. But that blew me away. It is a normal symbolism as well as the stars are the ancestors. But the twinkling, like Aureola 
like pulsing in the sky in that scene. It blew me away, made me cry, I think. Also, um, Dwarf Foll, uh, when he talks about his wife, I think um, he, there is also the symbolism of a star, I think. But I'm not sure about that. I know there is a twinkling star in that uh, episode with the dwarf. I'm not completely sure the context. If you rewatch it, look for that. So, um, yeah, uh, Aureola, like it's 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 so brilliant. And now I will uh, uh, I will blow your mind another time. Um, there is a very special kind of Aureolas, and it's the kind you would probably get when you Google. But it's the most um, uh, interesting. Aureola. So around the moon, sometimes there are special aureoles when the conditions, and they will blow you away as well, when the conditions are right, um, there are special types of aureola around the moon, and it's rainbow colored around the moon. And that also blew me away so much. Like, it's like, that's what Flamme uses, and Flamme was to aureola. So if we take this theme of them taking something they understood or connected with with them, we know that Flamme was to Aureola. She uses this rainbow magic stuff. So I am pretty, pretty sure, at least thematically, she understood something in Aureola and took something from Aureola with her and wove it into her. It might mean that she took like the, the knowledge of the ancestors, so to speak, and developed it like symbolically. Um, it's... Um, um, but it also, yeah, I think that's probably mainly it. Like she, she took the the people she knew before her that were important, and she shaped them into magic and did wonderful things with them, and used them, their knowledge, their their beings, their lessons to protect humanity from the demons with these brilliant rainbow colored spells she weaves. Um, we have this one spell, the barrier she weaves, which is apparently eternal. Um, you might it, it might be um the tree stuff I mentioned earlier. It might be, but that might also be like Aureola has some truth about life in a sense as well. So that would also make sense why she can use these trees and produce these things. Um also when she kills the demons and meets Frieren, there is a moon with the Aureola directly after she casts the spell, and it is brilliant and Frieren has the rainbow stuff a bit about around Zoltrak as well. And again, it's a part of, of, of Flamme she takes. It is a glimpse of the afterlife or, 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 or whatever you want it to stand for. And this is so well done. Like it is hidden in plain sight. And again, I say this a lot, but this might be a bit reaching, but I think the evidence shown in the show that this is a thing is so big. And if you rewatch it and know this, what an aureola is and what some of the symbolic connotations to it are, that is so beyond brilliantly done. Like, I love it. Like, like it, I couldn't believe it. And I, as I said, I, I realized this, like, in general, what an aureola was. Like, I was like, hey, wait, that, that, that sounds like aerosol. Is it a thing? And I tried to figure out what uh, aureola might be consisting of what like I thought it was a Wort Neuschöpfung, a new word. And I looked it up, didn't find it. Like I found some Frieren uh, wiki articles and um, I found a band and then I dug deeper and then there, there was this explanation and there were pictures and it's like exactly like in the show. It's, it's literally aureoles are shown all the time. Like it blew me away. And uh also, like stuff like Frieren hovering in front of the moon and the aureole shining strong behind her, the knowledge of the past and her goal being so strong in those scenes and Fern as well. And uh, or, or when the moon clears against Lugna, like like the the goal of of seeing Hydra again surges up in Fern, perhaps, or it is just her goal surges up again. Like, but the aureole is there; it is always there, and it is so well done. And please tell me, did this blow your mind or didn't it? Because it blew my mind so badly. Like, I couldn't stop thinking about this for days. Days. And I, I just was, what the fuck did I just watch? Like, and, and when I reacted, like there, were, like, there are some reactions. You will see that. Like, when, when I saw that Flamme uses rainbow magic and I had seen the pictures of the Aureola and they were looking exactly like that. I was like, what the fuck? This is not possible. They didn't think this through this 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> they didn't think this through this well. They did, I think. I think. Let me know what you think, but I hope the video uh, was worth this uh, for you at least and you've, you are still here and listen to that because that I think I found that out. I think no one else saw that before and it's very, very strong in the show. Like the sky, like Haita. Um, anyway, I, I, I would really love to hear your opinion on that. And uh, anyway, that was Aureole. And uh, I hope it blew your mind. I hope I've blown your mind at least once a bit. A bit. I don't know how passionate you about this you, you are. And I'm not saying that if you're passionate, you have to react like this. But for me, it was like, I love this. Like, this is one of my favorite things ever. Um, anyway. Ender. Yeah, we are at Ender. Ender is the end. Uh, the end of the story. Uh, end, of the, end of the Demon King as well. End of the journey. Will probably be the end of the journey now. And um, end of her tra travels. So, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. Also, end of the world. Like, literally. Um, we have some... Places that are uh, named after, like, uh, uh, um, their relations to end. So, anyway, uh, it's a very big thing. Um, I'm not going to use more time on it here because I think we will learn more about it. And I don't want to, like, there will probably be other things about end we learn. So, anyway. Yes. The Wille region. Um, Wille means uh, will, strength of mind. Like, I want to do this. I have the willpower to do this. Um, it is um, pretty obvious why it is here in the story. Um, it is because you have to have Wille to fight the Einsam. So um, I think that's pretty self explanatory. So, pit a lot, um, just a small word, but. Um, yeah, I like it. Um, it is a very, like, if I would be asked, are there, like, these big words uh, that are, like, associated with great things people would do, and having a strong will would be one of them. I don't know. I find that cool. So um, it's a very aptly named place, I guess. Ainzame. <laughs> Yeah, the Einsam. Um, Einsam, again, we have the E and the I, which is pronounced I. And it is, uh, it means lonely, the lonely one. Um, it is a monster, so it fits because we know, I think, that monsters are like demons because demons are the sub subclass of monsters, I guess, are lonely creatures per, per definition. And, um, also interesting, um, there are two Einsams. I didn't even realize that when I watched the episode. I like people told me in the comments it was like I was like, what? There wasn't because I thought Einsam had to be one, but it's even worse that there are two. Because um I have the feeling, also a bit speculation, of course, and perhaps nothing, but that the two Einsam didn't connect with each other. And because connection is such a strong theme of this whole fairy tale connecting with others being einsam is like the ultimate ultimate end where you get when you like it's where frieren is a bit that place loneliness but not completely yet like she's freezing but she's not frozen so to speak if that makes sense and the einsam is like a, a dark future you could be in when you um when you fail to find connections in your life and it's pretty well established that Frieren has found them already. They are just not present in her mind. She hasn't worked through them, not understood them perhaps, but they are there, as I said, with Himmel, with Flamme, with uh, Heiter in the background, in the art. Uh, and if the story is told around Frieren's perspective, that makes sense. So we get that she is connected. She doesn't know it or understand it really, though. So the Einsam is like, like two, two things that try to... Um, try to um, show you something, uh, the, the li a lie of companionship, so to speak. Um, 
like false friends. They conjure up false friends, people you think you love. They're in front of you, but they are lies and they're used to deceive you. And um, uh, in truth, you are still einsam, even though you think you're not. I think those are themes there as well. Like you're alone, even though like you think you're not alone, but you are. And I think that's a very sad thing, but uh, yeah. The Riegel Canyon. Um, I think we've got a new German thing. An I and an E is just... No, I think we had it before, right? It's just E again. Like, it's a long E. Um, so it's Riegel um, Canyon. And Riegel is like an old-fashioned lock. Uh, it also means something like, uh, like, a, like a mountain uh, uh, range, I think. Um, but that's not really that important because I think it is mainly here because... Um, there is like a lock in front of Stark, like a mental block, like something like that closes him, like it has to be opened and Frieren does that when she uh, talks him into fighting the dragon. Um, it's basically, uh, you have a regal in your head as something you would perhaps say to someone who's got a mental block and Stark has a mental block here and of course the dragon is a symbol for chaos and unknown and danger. And he has to face it. So he has to overcome, like he has to open the door in his mind and let his courage come in. And um, his fear as well, like he has to let his fear in, he has to push away the lock, the regal, and then he can beat the dragon. So um, it symbolizes uh, an obstacle in Stark's uh, life that Frieren saw, I think. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Stark himself. Um, it is um, it is body strength first and foremost, I think. But it's like like be being strong. It, it 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 Stark means strong, not strength, but strong. Um, and that's a theme with uh, uh, with Stark because he's physically very very strong. Might be the strongest character physically we've seen. I think he's stronger than Eisen, uh, which Eisen said. So I think Stark is the strongest character physically we know. Um, he's also very durable, so he's strong in resistance. Um, but um, he grapples with mental strength as well because the fear eats him up. So he tries uh, and, and he gathers strength as well. So he, he tries to be strong in the face of fear that's his theme. He sometimes fails, but I think that's his arc as well. Um, being strong against the fears uh, in battle, in danger, in death. And um, that's aptly named. And I really love that. So um, Stark is... Um, yeah, yeah. also uh, uh, Stark uh, is something um, a leader has. Like he has to be strong. Like it's the strength of a leader or of, of, of an idol. Someone you you admire like this kind of strength that is also stark and we have stuff like him um um playing weird in that one episode where he has to st show uh, uh to to pretend to be a leader and stuff and uh he's also stark because he deal or strong because he deals with fans shit <laughs> just it's like with a little smile on my face of course you know i love their relationship one of the best things in the show but um yeah, so so he's he's strong and um, he helps people a lot. Also, like like uh, a strong social person, like he's, he's a strong part of society, so to speak. And I I really love that. And um, yeah, uh, his brother uh, was stronger, I think, or better than him, so to speak, or that's what they said. But um, he still tries to understand what he is and. Anyway, that's his theme. Um, yeah. Val. Um, yeah, it means uh, uh, running water, like like uh, um, a like like an artificial creek or something is an old word. Um, it's probably because there are rivers around the city. I don't really know why it's there. Um, I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know why it's there. Like, 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 like it's probably 
something Frieren or whoever tells the story because it doesn't have to be Frieren. I, I just have that as a very strong hypothesis, but you can disagree. But sorry, anyway, um, I really don't know why it is, it is called that. Like that's very rem like a, a weak name, so to speak, in the story. But I also feel the place is not that um, not that important. I know it is where Eisen and Stark did some stuff together, um, but I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps um, in a in a like in a running water channel or something, whatever. Like this thing, this artificial water channel, you can like like it's um, um, controlled by someone. Um, so they also control the flow through the city into the north. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I know why it's really there. Like, those are just ideas, but anyway. Yes, Eng Road. Uh, it means an arrow, uh, an arrow, a narrow street. Again, the E, E, uh, which is pronounced E in German. Um, Eng Road, it's just a narrow road, and it's like a very small plot point. They, it's too too narrow. There's a rock slide. They have to clean it, so car, cars can go through. Like it's it's not not that not that big of a thing. Graf Granat. I put Graf here as well because Graf is a German uh, nobility title. And it means something like count, like it's something like a count. Um, and uh, granada is kind of um, a gemstone. I will put one up here somewhere. I don't know. So you can look at it. And um, it is probably because he's a warrior and an honorable, noble warrior as well. Like he's got a noble bloodline, um, which is why he's not like rock, but he's like a very precious stone. He's also very precious, good-willed, and intelligent, and uh, a great character, so it's like he's also like a gem. For me, he was also one of the best side characters, so, so he was like a gem for me as well to experience, but I, I'm biased there. He's my, uh, as I said, I don't even know if I just said it, it's late. Uh, my favorite side character probably loved this stuff with his son. Um, yeah. He's, he was very well done, and I think these uh, associations fit him well. For a side character, he's got a lot of lot going for him, a very well-written story, and I like the name that he's like something like a gemstone, so very well, it fits very well. Ah, uh, yes! If you've seen my reaction, you know what this means. I laughed my ass off. It's it's pronounced Lügner. Now we've got the last of the weird uh, uh, fly shit things. It's a U. The fly shits uh, above it. It's called Ü. <laughs> so Lügner um, basically means liar because he lies in every scene he's in. Um, most notably, he lies. Uh, um, because he's a demon, but he also lies to Granade about the peace. He lies about his like uh, his son dying. Like he uses the the um, because demons use lies as tools, and he uses this tool very well. So I really like Lord Lügner. Got spoiled on demons a bit on what they are, so to speak. Like that they were not really like there was no real social goodness in them but they were just this natural they were primal beings and and acted like that so um yeah lugner uses words as as i said as tools and he will just um try to get what he wants uh and says the word he wants uh that others want to hear but not that are true necessarily which is something I discussed at length in the corresponding episode. If you want more on that, look there, but I think it would derail it here. But basically, it is also a symbol for corruption, for, um, yeah, some, some, and I also as well a bit said, like, corrupt politicians, something like that. Like, I mean, he's technically is that. Um, he's very well spoken for a demon. So um, 
He's a lord as well, like a lord demon, but he's a liar, deceiver, and I really love that, and it was a funny name, it fit him perfectly, anyway. Aura the guillotine. Aura, yeah. I had to think a bit about this. You might say these are not perfectly fitting, but Aura is pronounced Aura in German, but it means the same thing, like this thing around you. And why is that? She's got this aura of self-confidence around her. She uses auras of, of mana to, to put on the scales. Uh, she has an aura of corpses, so to speak, around her uh, that she commands. So um, I think that's a good guess. Um, um, and of course, by the way, uh, all of the statues don't have a head because she tells them to cut it off. And that's harrowing. I only realized that later. And um, yeah, I, 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 she, she's got this presence as well a bit. Like, uh, I really like her. There's not that much to the name. Perhaps I miss some spiritual context here, but it's basically aura of corpses, aura of like confidence and aura of um, that, like judging auras of strength, of mana. I don't know. Let me let me know if you have more on her. Linia, our good friend Linia, um, Li Ni E. Again, an I and an E. Normally, you would uh, pronounce this E, as I said, but this is one of the few special cases where you would say Li Ni E, and you part them. So normally you would always say lini, but in this special case, because I think it's from Latin, you would say lini e. You know, it's not, uh, uh, it has its roots in Latin and it kept them, that's why you pronounce it a bit differently. Um, yeah, there are many, 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 many suggestions in the comments and thank you all so much for bringing them. I will put some on the screen here, I think, not all of them, but thank you all for, to comment. And I will sum up all of the associations we had. And I might, I might forget some, I'm sorry, but so first we have like, she has like a production line of weapons she creates. She puts her hands in a line. She uh, has to have line of sight to observe people. Uh, she uh, thrusts like line, like attacks a lot. Um, she um, uh, is, is very... Uh, um, linear in thinking, so to speak. She traces the lines of her opponent's mana, so to speak, figuratively, and imitates them. Um, she, she, she is like one trick pony a bit, so like just one thing, like linear. Um, yeah, she charges linearly with her attack. Um, she's very straightforward. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I probably missed some, but yeah, she's so dense. So many, there's so many suggestions. They all fit. We're just testament to exactly what I said. Like they have these names that encapsulate so much of their essence of these characters. And it feels almost as if this was grown naturally, as if this story developed through the ages and these concepts are now there. But of course it was written by one person, but man, I love it. Linia is like one of the best names. Because it's not obvious immediately, but there are so many ideas you can see. And again, as I said before, you don't have to agree with all of them, but there are people that would agree with one of those, I guess, and people are different, so everyone would find something, some meaning in linear for themselves. So, I don't know. Did you find it? Or did you have even more suggestions now? I don't know. I love thinking about linear. That's so cool. <laughs> Draht. Yeah, he uses Draht. Draht means uh, wire. Um, so the H uh, makes the R long. Draht. Um, yeah, he kills people with wire. That's why, that's why it's called Draht. He's also Drahtig, which means like, I think, bulky um, and, and looks strong a bit. That's also something we would say in German, Drahtig. Um, also, uh, him and Linie, like these line-like structures, someone has uh, suggested that's like because they're a bit like spies in the human world, like um, uh, listening in, like uh, the phone lines. I, I don't know, I love 
I love that though. It's very cool suggestion. So yeah, that was Draht. Like he was like in two scenes. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Oh yeah, the the this is the two attacks, so to speak. First one is the one used by Lord Lügner, and this is interesting. So, in my subs, there it was called Bluterei, um, but he says Arteria, and I don't know why. And it's so weird. So um, they are similar. They are both related to blood. Bluterei is like um, a lot of blood. Um, again, by the way, there's this E and this I, Bluterei, and oh god, in Arteria, I just realized it's like in Linear, you also have I and E and you pronounce them separately. I'm so sorry, it's also from Latin, by the way, so <laughs> I'm so sorry. Those. So we've got two words where it's weird, never thought about that. The more you learn when you think about stuff of, about your own language, but yeah, Arterie and uh, Bluterei. So Bluterei, as I said, it's like losing a lot of blood and um, doesn't have to be lethal, by the way. It's just like uh, if, if you like have a little wound on your like finger and you spread blood everywhere, it's also Bluterei. Um, but it's like a lot of blood in a way is everywhere, um, which is in line with what he does. Arteria, um, I might be mistaken. He might name it Arteria if that's the name, because uh, I think arteries were used for. Um, I don't know what it's called when you like. Uh, uh, if you, if you're sick and you like pump like let out the blood, um, um, to get clean again or or healthy, which they did in medieval times, which killed a lot of people. Perhaps I know medicine people are in the comments who know this probably better than I do. So tell me if an artery like what is it called like. Uh, bloodletting, I think it's called. So I think arteries are used for bloodletting. I don't know. I don't know. That's. I think I know that from school. I might be completely wrong. Please, medics, uh, please, medical people in the comments. I know you're there. You're very awesome. Please tell me if like what artery would be here. Like, is that the one you use uh, bloodletting on? I don't know. Anyway, it makes a lot of sense that he calls this a text because he loses uses a lot of blood. Erfassen, which means um, understanding, locking on, like pointing something down. And um, that's basically what uh, Linia uses to like, like she makes sure she can reach her target in a direct line. It's like, uh, um, it's like in her locked on, uh, understood, she's going there now. That's basically what Erfassen means. Um, it might also mean uh, uh, Erfassen is something. Uh, getting to know or learning something sometimes. So learning because she's, perhaps she copied Stark, Stark there. I don't know. Perhaps she has to say that when she copies stuff because Erfassen is like also you, uh, Erfassen like, like collecting data and uh, like, like ordering them. Like, like that's also sometimes said. I don't think I said that in the reaction. So here it is. It is also like data collecting. I think like, um, uh, um, like, like in the census, you would erfassen the people, like to write them down their names. So, I guess that also, like, I didn't think about it. That it is probably her technique where she copies stuff. Basalt, the throne. Basalt, as I learned from a kind person, is a volcanic rock. So, I mean, he looks hard and sturdy. Like all the warriors have like these sturdy, hard uh, things as names. Um, granite has a, a type of stone or jewel. Um, um, Eisen has and uh, basalt has. So it's like a warrior thing. Uh, it basically means he was very sturdy, I think. That's all I get here. <laughs> Aus Erlese is like. Um, it is picking the best stuff for harvesting. Um, I think uh, I think it should be auslese. So the er is I don't know why it's there. It still makes sense, I think, but I would call it auslese in German. Um, I think it's a mix from choosing and uh, harvesting certain crops or uh, grapes. 
but it makes sense like um uh, uh she harvests the mana souls and puts them on the scales with this i think it's uh, very reasonable to call it that so um yeah and we have the a and the u there pronunciation wise so again it's the au like with aureole it is aus erlese so Okay, so now we go to äußerst. So if we have the ä and the u, it is an oi. Like you would probably do write down in English oi, like the same sound. So äußerst, it is the outermost, um, the 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 like at the rim, at the at the edge, and. I think the äußerst, uh, I think, is it a re region? Is it a place? No, it's the city. I think it's the city, like the most outer city closest to the north, which, I mean, uh, makes sense. I suspect I will, in Core 2, get back to this and uh, discuss this more because we might learn more about it. So I will not go into it here because I think I will talk about it again in Core 2 explanation. Yes, the Decker region. Uh, Decker means uh, cover or ceiling. Uh, so it is the ceiling of the continent a bit. Um, there is a snow cover on the ground all the time, apparently, perhaps. And um, yeah, it is um, also a, a Decker is, uh, as it is, it is cover. So it might be uh, because they rest there for a year or half a year. So I don't know. Um. Schwer mountain. Yeah, schwer mountain. So S C H is sh. So in English, you would not have the C. But um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's uh, uh, it's a German thing, I guess, that they have the C in there. But it's basically the same as S H in English. Schwer mountain. Um, yeah, schwer means heavy, uh, heavy or um, difficult. And it is a point in the story where, like, like it's snowy, so the sky isn't showing. Like, I think this is a point where Frieren is just really down. I don't actually remember, and I'm sorry if there was a reason for it or if she just got very, very melancholic and sad out of the sun because of the weather. So um, she collapses there, and um, um, it's very heavy on her soul, this region, and um, she has to fight against it. And uh, it is very aptly named in the sense that it is schwer in the story. I like it a lot. I have to think more about it as well because I think um, it symbolizes a bit of passage where they were really burdened by their journey, just by their journey. Like there was just like this, the, the, the weather was just weird and stuff. Like it was no big bad animal. It was just heavy on her soul there. And I like that a lot. So that's what, what I see in the Schwer Mountains. <laughs> Kraft, man. I talked about that as well in the um, reaction. That is a big term and basically means force, strength. Um, yeah, force or strength in every conceivable way. It is a very big and meaningful word. Um, it's, the, the, it's the same thing, uh, like it's a spiritual strength, so to speak, or physical strength, like just Getting craft is like being reinvigorated as well. Um, it's a very, very dense, very dense thing. It's a bit like flamme almost, like there's a lot of stuff associated with it. So I think I will limit it to what I think it is here. It gives them new strength to move on because they're in the schwer mounds. They're, it's difficult. They lose, they're like, they, they lose track of their objective a bit. They feel down and heavy. And now they get new strength to continue their journey, basically. So that's what Kraft did here. And I'm sure we will come up again because he was at the, like, in the statue. So I will also not go more into it. And we will probably talk about him again. If we don't, I'm sorry. You, like, ask me in a live stream when I have better internet. I, I don't know.
Yes, Appetit Region. Um, this is, of course, um, uh, uh, Appetit is um, something almost like appetite, and it's exactly what you think having like hunger, being hungry in a positive way. And of course, this has to do with um, Stark uh, eating the hamb hamburgers uh, and all the themes that are linked to them. Um, I really like that it's a little one, it's a little place, but um, yeah, it, it, is, uh, uh, it is also a bit um, appetite. <laughs> I know this sounds stupid, but it's, and it might be reaching even for me, <laughs> really be reaching, but you can have appetite for someone a bit. So fan showing interest in Stark could also be a bit of appetite. But it's a very filthy word in that context, I think. Like, it's, it's, I mean, uh, a fan would call me a perf for that interpretation, probably. So, appetite haben for someone is like exactly what you think it means, I think. So, I don't know if you want that interpretation here or take it as something they intended, but it's funny. So, anyway, I gave it to you here. <laughs> Stolz. In my subs, it was written with a T. It's not written with a T. Like, there are some names actually that are written, like where it's written with a T, like real German family names. Uh, Stolz. But uh, it, is, it comes from Stolz and it means pride. So, um, he was like his brother was the pride of his father. He was his Stark's pride. Uh, his brother was pride on him. Um, which is also something very important. He was the only person pride on Stark in his village. Um, he died pridefully, like he stood in front of his death. And um, yeah, I, I think that's... Uh, um, and I think Stark feels pride uh, uh, for his brother. Um, also, uh, through the hamburgers that he made Stark, he was proud on him as well. So I think this, this theme of pride and having pride in someone you love or something you love is very strong in this character. And I hope we get more pride situations because I think he's very, very, very interesting. Yeah, the, the alt woods. Alt means old. Um, and I initially thought it was just that, but it also means, in a sense, grown up and not necessarily wise, but old. Old people, like old people, like you're old. You are having experience, a lot of experience in life. And it fits perfectly uh, for this episode um, because it is a place where grown ups are and where one grown up um, struggles with being a grown up and regrets. So um, I like that this place is called Alt. Um, like, you could say it's grown up. Like, it's not directly that meaning, but it, it means old, but old and also in grown up. So not necessarily wise, as I said, but grown up. Zayn is next to Flamme and... Um, um, Kraft, probably the densest word. It means to be. Um, it's the present of being. So being in the present. And um, we will probably see more about Zion in the future. And I talked like half an hour in the reaction about him already. Um, I will summarize it here a bit. If you want even more info on Zion and the meaning of to be and why he's called that, I discussed that at length in the episode reaction. It's episode 13 if you want to check it out. And um, it is basically, it, it, he's called that because he's struggling and living in the present and um, tries to t deal with that. So um, he has like, um, he has many ad addictions to almost everything you can be addicted to. Like it's implied that we, to women, it's implied, but also we see uh, alcohol, tab tabasco, uh, tabasco, tobacco, and um, what was the last thing? Gambling. So, like, very things that gratify you in the present and will F up your future. And um, it's also... Um, um, it also has this connotation of we are... 
uh, you just are. Like there's nothing special in your life. It's just like being, wasting away. That, that connotation is something it can have as well. And it shows in the episode a lot. Um, and it, it's like, like this, this numbness to life, to everyday life. And being, realizing you're a grown up and being like, I'm, I just am. Like there's nothing more, no meaning. My meaning is lost. And um, yeah, if you want more, as I said, it, I would be here like an hour more if I talk more about this probably or half an hour. I will not exaggerate, but because I already did talk half an hour about it in the reaction, you can watch it. I think it's good commentary, very good one. Probably one of my best in the reactions, actually, even though it was a heavy tangent. But I think I really nailed Zion's character already in the reaction. So check that out. Yeah, Rad region. Um, that's weird. I don't know. I, I've looked it up. I didn't find that word. It could be Rad as in wheel or uh, Rad as in council. Um, I don't know which of those two it is, actually. I really don't know. Um, so I will just chalk it up to um, a mistranslation, misspelling. I don't know what this means. Um, perhaps because they have to fix the wheels on the card. Is that where the bird, like, is the bird still on Rad? In the Rad region? I mean, they are with a card where the, where the wheels break and they have to fix them, I think. I, I don't know, perhaps. Um, I mean, you could also interpret Rad as a ring. Like a rad is a ring shape, so the ring is important. The anklet is also a rad, um, uh, not the anklet, the uh, uh, bracelet uh, is a rad. You can say that, perhaps, I don't know. Per do you think that makes sense? Perhaps. But uh, uh, yeah, anyway, otherwise I, I don't know why. Yeah, Bande Woods, man, I love this. So Bande can mean several things, like uh, a band of thieves, so to speak, that band. But here it is clearly the um, uh, links between people, like it's like, uh, in link. And a Bande, in this case, like with rings shared, like it's bands, like, like, like links that you forge with love um, or with very close friendship. Um, uh, that's what it means, and it's a very powerful word, and it is often used in marriages in Germany. So um, it fits the episode perfectly because the love between Himmel and uh, Frieren that might be there from Frieren's side or not, and she hasn't realized. And Himmel, I think, loves her. I think that was is pretty pretty likely that he does. Um, and Fern and Stark's love as well that develops, and like like it is. Um, you would say in German, they uh, bande knüpfen, so uh, um, forging links. Like it's a very deeply meaningful thing. And it was a very deeply meaningful episode. And it is a place where ties and links were forged between characters that might last forever, that are holy and important. And I really loved that. It, that was such a wholesome thing, very meaningful. And if uh, uh, it would, like, you could also interpret as as uh, being engaged. So it is where Frieren and uh, Stark got engaged, so to speak. I don't know. I mean, I know Fern and Stark laughed at it, but um, it might be the, the real inception of their romantic relationship. I really like that. The Laub. Hills, um, Laub, again, A and U, Au, Laub, um, it means foliage. I think there's a lot of foliage in the place. I have no clue. Sorry, I have, I have to pass on this. I don't know. Perhaps it's better in the manga. I will read the manga uh, down the line. I really, really want to see how, how, how often Aureole is depicted and the moon and stuff. I need to see that on the panels. But I digress. I don't know why it's called Laub Hills other than there is foliage on the ground and there are many trees and it might be autumn. I, I, I just don't know. Forik. Forik is a, a city and um, it uh, might mean before. Uh, so it might be the um, uh, 
um, euphoric, um, something that was in the past but is, is not there anymore. So the previous, the euphoric is also previous. Um, so it, so the the v is is pronounced f here, euphoric. Um, I think there are two main things about this. Once it is uh, like, um, uh, 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 um, like it's also locally like in front of something, so it's like very far uh, uh, to the north. Like uh, um, you would say vorgelagert in German. I don't know what the English word is like. Set in front of uh, a camp, like um, like if you have a camp and there are enemies in the distance, like a vorgelagerte post is like an outpost, like in front of it, a bit closer to the enemy. So that also means Forig, but it is also filled with this regret that Orden has for his son. Like um, he is living in the past. He regrets having this argument with his son. And um, it, there is a lot of stuff that was before that like really directly bleeds into the action here of the episode. And I guess that's also why it is called Forig, because um, it, it is a lot about um, both weird and pride uh, uh, stolz uh, with a stark storyline and uh, I really like it uh, I think the characters are a bit too shallow for Frieren they, I would have loved them to be a bit less shallow but um, like they are good characters but you, you, they, they are the only characters in the whole story I see as plot devices a bit sad and, uh, but uh, yeah anyway <laughs> Yeah, so Orden um, means uh, badge or um, order. So like Order of the Phoenix or like the badge you get on battle. Um, I guess uh, he is called that because he's like a very noble, strong-minded person, I, I think. Again, even the name is weird. Like, yes, there is some stuff to him. Like, it's it's like someone who has earned a badge, uh, a pro, like, pro, like his, his scar that he has also some, uh, I mean, sometimes you say uh, you wear that as a badge of honor, like a scar. Also reaching, um, also it's only a, it is only an English saying as well. I think it's not really one in German. So I don't know. Orden really, like that part of the story was a bit weird. I don't know why. Um, uh, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, this one as well. It's so weird. Wirt. Um, Wirt means innkeeper or host. I think it is called uh, um, that because Stark has to be the host of this party, so to speak. And he has to um, replace the Voriger host. I know it's like this is I'm sorry with these they are they are very shallow the names even I don't have a deep connection to them um I, I I'm sorry I, perhaps this part I'm I'm sorry I don't I don't want to get into that episode here but these words as well Laubhills, um Orden Wirt it's like they are probably the most shallow words unless I'm missing something please I would love you to tell me no you got this wrong like this is this and this meaning, but I felt all of this episode was probably the most shallow, um, save for the, uh, like because it was mainly to, just to show us Stark more, which I loved, and Stark and fans' relationship, which I loved, but the rest was weird. Um, and also I think, yeah, I don't even remember, is it the episode where in the beginning we have the, um, the, the flower? Yeah, okay. <laughs> It wasn't even, it didn't even, I don't know. Anyway. Gabel. Gabel. Yeah, that means fork. Like knife and fork, like he's the butler. Moot. Um, yeah, you know. I was so confused about this as well. I hope he comes up again because it made no sense why he's called Moot. Moot means courage. He didn't show courage. Um, 
I didn't get that from him. No, sorry. I, I don't know why. I hope he comes up in the future and just this was just preparation and we get the real meanings in the future. Because in Core 1, these were all like, I didn't really get their meaning. Like they were just words and they meant remotely, like stuff remotely close to some story beats. Like it still fits with this fairy tale interpretation I have, but it is very iffy. I don't know. I might, you know what? I would love to discuss episode 15 in a live stream. I might do it. Uh, tell me if you want that, because that one really was weird. I don't know why. Yeah, so now the last episode of Core One, we are almost at the close. Um, fall. Old man fall. We know what fall means, full. Uh, I think he is full of memories, full of life. He's old. He's had it all. And he's so full that stuff fades. Um, he's full of love for his wife, full of wisdom in battle, uh, full of um, full of deceit in his fighting methods. Um, I love that. Um, so I guess that's because we talked about it in Fall Bazin as well. I think that's basically all we have from him here. Uh, is there more? Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's more. Rohr Road. Rohr means pipe. I guess because it's very uh, straightforward where they go. Um, perhaps something else will come up, but I wouldn't know anything. Like currently, it's just like a very straight road. It's a bit like Eng. Uh, Eng and Rohr are basically the same. Eng even, I, I mean, Eng had a problem that it posed, like because Eng is like, it was narrow there to work there. But Rohr, there was nothing yet with Rohr. I think they are still on Rohr though. So there might be something in Core, core 2. Tür. Um, also, Tür is the U with the two uh, fly shits. But um, I think that will come up later in Core 2 again. So I will also not talk about it here. It means door. And it might be the door to the northern lands. There might be other doors involved as well. Something might be opened at that place, uh, but it was just mentioned. And um, I don't know. I, I think uh, uh, Raw Road and Tyr will come up in Core 2 again. I think they are still on Raw Road. So, um, yeah. Okay, so that were the German words in Core 1. I hope you found some of it interesting at least. And uh, I hope you uh, excuse me not going into everything all the time because sometimes I already talked about it at length and I didn't want to double it. And sometimes I feel things are coming up in the future, like tour or uh, mood. Um, I don't know if they are going to come up. If they don't come up, um, I just couldn't say more to them here at this place because I didn't fully think them like like got them as a feeling i didn't get what they really were about perhaps so um please keep that in mind as well and also tell me if there were things that blew your mind and uh, tell me if things made sense here if i overreached too much all the time if you learned something if you like the german lessons and um before i will go to the conclusion there's one thing i will still do because you voted for it. Um, there is a word we have talked about today that has a second meaning that might be a potentially, only potentially. I just want to be very sure because seeing stuff like, um, let's say, Himmel, because it's not Himmel, like uh, saying stuff like seeing stuff like that, how intricately all these meanings are considered in the storytelling, like the big ones. Um, I think there might be something to it. There might not be. It might just be an interpretation we could make in the end on our own. It doesn't have to be in the story, but it might be a major story beat uh, in the end of Frieren, this second translation of a word. And that is why I want to tell you spoilers. I don't know if it is one, and I don't want to clickbait anything, but, but when I realized this, I was also mind blown so, so badly. And um, I just want to warn you here. And you voted. I will put it in. I will mark it down with a stamp. So 
it is coming now. You can skip ahead past it and then you will never hear it. And I hope people, please don't spread it if people don't want to hear it. It is still, it is just a translation and it is in part my interpretation and it might not be. So take this with a thousand tons of grains of salt, but I will now go in, into it. And you can tell me what you think perhaps, but please put in the comments then spoiler do double whatever and then like do it so that people don't read it. Um, that would be very lovely. So, last warning, three, two, one. Okay, so the word, of course it's this word that has a second meaning, it's close to the one we at length discussed, but it is so much more deep and um, it would perfectly encapsulate the main themes I already talked about today as well. And the word is of course aureola. Aureola has a second meaning and it is similar to what we talked about, but um, aureola does not only mean it's the shine around a celestial body. Aureola also means the shine around a person. And the shine around a person um, makes this one sentence that we have, and it, the, the whole story starts with a sentence. And if you interpret it in this way, I think it gives a very, very big hint in how it ends. And you can disagree and you might be like, yeah, this was nothing, that's okay. It is just, I think, if I would have written it, I would have written it like this, which doesn't mean there are not other ways to write it better. It probably are because the author is better than me. But you know, that's what I would have felt was really good. So my thing about the ending, because we have this, this, this saying, I went to Aureole, the land where the souls are or something. And I read that first and I was like, okay. But then it is also mentioned again, uh, Aureole where the souls are. So my prediction, it is just a prediction for the ending, is that when you are an aureola, you can only speak with the dead when you have connected with them. So, um, so to speak, you have to have an aureola around yourself as well. Like, like the, the, the people you connected with you have to shine forth from you. You have to have gained a deep understanding of them. So you are finally able to get them back from the afterlife in the end. So this would mean that it is a bit friends along the way trope, but not, it is also not. So the journey Frieren is on currently, the journey of connecting with the people, the journey of learning about them, uh, about learning the little details, the mundane things, learning what they thought, felt, what the importance in life were together with them. That is necessary to speak with them in Aureole. So it is not just um, accidentally, oh yeah, by the way, we, we went this way. I had all the memories. That was a fun little side thing. And now we're in Aureole and we can talk some stuff through that I thought up on the journey. No, no, it will probably be if I'm right. It might, as I said, just a stupid theory. But it might be that in the end, it is implied or revealed that only those people who connected with their past, who knew them, who sh linked with them, um, who understood them, can speak to them then in Aureola. And I think that also um, um, is a very, very, very heavy symbolism then, because it basically means, um, it basically is the, the theme of connecting with people learning from them, carrying them in the f into the future, which is like this big theme in the whole anime. It was from, from episode one and two onwards. It was that theme always in it. And um, it is like, um, it symbolizes stuff like um, you have to learn from your ancestors. Um, uh, you have to carry the, the culture into the future, the truth they had, the, the learning they did. You have to take that to develop further. You have to uh, understand people. You have to be with people, not a demon, not someone who's not connected. You have to connect with people to see them again so, so that it is as if you speak to them again. And I think they will speak. I think they will because this is fantasy. It's a fairy tale. There's magic. They will be able to speak to them, I think. I think. But they... They, they will talk, they will probably also make comments about the journey because I think they're already there. Like the connections are already there a bit. Like we see the symbolism of the, of Himmel. 
We see the symbolism with Haita, with Aureola, with the stars. We see that they're there present in the story, subconsciously, not yet fully connect, connected, but not yet understood they're there. And in the end, they will comment on stuff and they will be like, you've grown, you've understood us. I like that you understood that what we did there now and stuff. That might, again, all of this is just speculation, but yeah. And, and it also would make so much sense why, uh, why, why Flamme is so special. Flamme was an aureole and spoke to the fallen, to the people she once fought with, probably other dead as well. She learned from the past. She, she was in line with the people, like the ultimate person who linked with people, who carried them in the future and in turn started her own stuff, started magic, like, like started uh, perhaps like perhaps the, the, the blessing stuff or at least uh, made the religions more, more prominent. I think that's uh, still, I don't know if that's the case. But, um, and um, I think um, Flamme also starts to make through that, through this aureola theme, which is also like a flame, like a, a ray, like an aura of light around you. Like, like it, it's starting to burn, like this, this aura that Frieren has of Aureola. Metaphorically, or really, really speaking, I don't even know, but that it was ignited by Flamme and her, uh, uh, the, the person who, who, who understood the dead and learned from them and connected with them so well that she perhaps even, and that's, again, theory, hypothesis only, created magic with that essence of the dead, so to speak, like the souls woven into it, like Aureole, the, the, the rainbow, woven into her magic. So, of course, her grimoires don't work because people have not been to Aureola. They need to be to Aureola to make the grimoires work, I think. Again, spitballing you, complete random nonsense, at least might be, you know, but... Um, and the last thing, um, which is also incredibly, is aureoles can only form when there is ice crystals in the air. So it has to be frieren for aureola to appear. By the way, that's also... But I don't know if the author even knew this. I don't know if any of this is true. Um, but and, and I don't want to go more into it. I think there are other hints that point to this. But I think I've already said enough. I hope I didn't spoil the ending. I hope it is perhaps like it would, would fit thematically and everything, but I don't know. Perhaps the author has another idea. Uh, and I trust the author to, um, uh, in the end, give us a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea of what Aureola is and some twist there. But that would be a twist. Like, without the way there's no Aureola, without, and it's called So So No Frieren, Funeral March. Uh, coming to terms with regret uh, of, of not connecting with people, that would be the ultimate proof that she did, that the funeral march is over in the end. Anyway, spoilers over now. Spoilers over. So, I hope anyone is still here. I hope I didn't bore you to death. I hope you had some cool experiences watching this and didn't click off the video after two minutes, but then you wouldn't be here. Uh, if I, uh, if you were still in the live premiere, I hope you had a blast. Um, I hope I brought something of value to you as well, because I, th that's what I want. Um, and, uh, I really liked doing the core one reaction and I didn't think anyone would watch it to be fair. Like I didn't, um, when I posted it, I, I was like, yeah. I didn't know anything about it. I was like, okay, watched it. I loved it. I posted the reaction. I was like, yeah, what's it going to be? Like 100 people will watch it because that's like most of my things get like 200 to 800 views. Sometimes Warhammer uh, analysis reactions uh, get 1,000, but that's my upper ceiling. I don't get more. And like I got like 30,000 views on it. And I was like, where did that come from? And uh, it pushed me past the 5,000 subs mark, which I never thought I would get this year, uh, last year. It's not last year. So thank you so much for being here. To you in the premiere um, and also to you watching still. Um, thank you so much for, for, for listening to this idiot talk here and uh, showing someone he loves, I think, because I really love Frian. Um, 
was a very, very emotional journey. And I learned so much. And peeling down these layers, even though, even though you might say to all of them they were nonsense, you might say that. Um, but it was such an experience. I had such a blast. Like, I, I hope one day my daughters will watch these videos as well and get to know me, um, at least how I was when I was this age. And um, so these videos are also very important because I think I've like I've opened up a lot in my reactions. I always do that because I want to do truthful content. But I think in Frieren I opened up the most on the channel here. So I think my daughters should I die before my time. I hope I won't. But they at least will know some stuff of me and carry me into the future one day. And um, it's been such a pleasure to watch this. Can't wait to watch more. Um, can't wait for Core 2. I can't wait for the ending and uh, opening uh, interpretation. Also, there will, of course, be new anime reactions now because Frieren is on a weekly basis now and solo leveling is. And um, yeah, Attack on Titan is still ongoing. I will do that every other day. And um, yeah, consider checking out some of my other content. I mean, you know how I do things. I pause a lot, I know. People get annoyed by it some, but um, I don't care anymore, fortunately. Um, but 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 I like that people that are like, yeah, do you pause too much? Are very kind about that. Like I never take that as a as a like. I know some people might just not like it, and there are probably other people that don't pause and discuss it after the episode, and uh, you get uh, uh, their deep thoughts about it. You know, it's it's fine. It's just my style. It's the way I love doing it, and I think if I hadn't reacted the way I did with all the pausing and sometimes uh, asking a question that was <laughs> answered 10 seconds later, I would never have been Im as immersed in this as I am now. And I think Frieren is one of my favorite things ever created. And um, yeah, I will read you my conclusion now. I've written it down. It's the only thing I really read down in sentences. I think it's sentences. So... Um, Please uh, 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 let me read it to you so you won't have to uh, endure all the uh, oohs I probably probably used. So, um, so let me read the conclusion. Frieren is a fairy tale on a gigantic scale that deals with life, death, being human, and what it means to be alive, die, and live in society. To me, it especially emphasizes the importance of our past and the people that came before, the people we left behind. It is to truthfully and meaningfully live life and to treasure others, but also beware of people who lie and are egomaniacs, sociopaths, and psychopaths. It paints a complex, nuanced picture of all of this and is probably one of the most important pieces of art of the 21st century in my mind, which it is, I think. I, I'm not just saying that, it is. If you like these takes, consider checking out my Frieren blind react analysis. <laughs> And analysis of Attack on Titan. Um, also, I will soon start Core 2 of Freedom. I will. I already said that. Also, suggest uh, the su suggestions for the next anime or reactions are still open. Feel free to suggest animes so you know my style. Um, I was thinking like stuff like uh, that has been suggested is like 86 uh, Apothecary's Diary or something. Um, uh, Evangelion is something I want to do one day as well. People have told me it's not interpretable. I will do that <laughs> one day. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Or, or Tanya the Evil, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I suggest your ideas. So I hope you stay well, found something interesting and of value for yourself in this video. I wish you all the best as always and take care. And don't forget to consider listening to my story, which I would, I would be very glad if people did. I put a lot of work into it try to figure out what a parent is for myself in a horror sad setting and uh, it's harsh it's sad it's a bit wholesome but uh, i think you might also like it if you like frieren it's it's darker but i think there's emotion in it as well anyway as i said take care see you soon perhaps bye